Welcome back to another live stream here on Tournamade. Um, after yesterday's debacle and uh, complete and utter failure of uh, Autodesk software uh, maintaining my UVs, um, I've decided to go about this in a different way. I'm going to try and uh, eliminate... Uh, the possibility for error, and uh, and also try to speed up my workflow just a little bit. So what I'm doing in 3ds Max is I'm going into wherever there are going to be UV seams. Now this really only works because I've already done this. I've already unwrapped this object. I already know where the seams that were placed yesterday go, and all I'm doing is I'm just splitting those edges. So if I select this object here. Uh, in open border, you can see, hey, hey, Brittany, how you doing? Uh, you can see uh, with the open border selected here that all of where my UV seams are all light up red. Now, the trick with this is that that means that these are automatically creating islands inside of Maya. And when I'm done with the object, I just need to select all my vertices again and hit weld, and it'll collapse it back down to the shape that it was before. And so that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through mesh by mesh here and identify where those UV seams are supposed to go um, and just split them. And that should reduce my time inside of, uh, inside of Maya dramatically. Now, I don't typically work in this way. Um, I'm just really only doing this because of the, the debacle of yesterday. Hey, hey, Yash. How you doing, brother? Hey, Ash, did you ever get the uh, the rig completely done? I know you're, I saw the, uh, what you had posted on LinkedIn, but did you ever get like a full weight painting done on it? Or were you, uh, were you only ever planning on doing just the, uh, just the rig creation itself? I'm good, Brett. I'm good. I'm good. It's been a while since I've seen you. You're, uh, you're done school now, I assume, I think from... Judging by when I last saw you, I think that that fits. Split this guy. Think. Split it. Good, good. Lovely to hear. Split. Um, and let's go all the way around this fellow here. So again, really the only reason that this is any faster is uh, just because I already, I've already unwrapped this. Um, I kind of remember where the seams, where the UV splits were, and that's that's what's going to speed this up. Jack or the girl, they're both weight painted. Cool. Yeah, no, I just, uh, I know you painted the, you um, you posted the the rigging part of it when you got it done. But, uh, but yeah, I never saw uh, an end result to the, uh, the weight painting. Never saw what you uh, did with that. Did you post it? Cool, man. Excited to take a look. I'm excited to take a look. I'm going to be doing a, uh, a shortcut with this project in terms of the rigging, as I will have a character who is uh, good to go for this project, um, but there's no need for a rig. I'm actually going to... Uh, I'm just going to be taking the animations off of um, Default White Robot Guy from Unreal. And as such, I don't really have a big need uh, to recreate a rig. And the animations are going to look a little wonky on the character that I'm using, but um, at the uh, at the end of the day, that's not what I do. So I'm going to uh, save myself a little bit of time. Okay, that, 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 that. 
The interior, which is separate pieces. Okay, that looks good. We'll bump on out of here. Uh, Yash, have you seen this project? Have you been uh, watching the uh, the videos? Drop this down to 15. Try and knock these two out at the same time here. So, Britt, what are you, uh, what are you doing now? Are you looking for work now? Now that school is over with? And uh, where are you looking? What kind of stuff are you looking to do? Last time I taught you... You were uh, doing a little bit of everything, but uh, now that you've finished the program, I don't know where you end up in terms of a skill set. Zoom in on this a little bit. Okay, shift edge, one split. <coughs> So yeah, so it's this is for um ooh. I mean to split that. Um this is for George Brown in the fall when we uh we go and do our remote learning again. And uh I gotta do a character class and hopefully try and keep these kids um interested uh while we uh are working remotely and that is gonna be tough um it's hard enough keeping uh, keeping students attentions when they're uh, they're in the class um and have them pay attention let alone when they're uh when they're not in the class and so I'm trying to set up something here that will hopefully make the uh class a little bit more enjoyable and Keep people interested in what we're doing. But uh, again, who the hell knows what's going to happen. How hard or different, I should say, is rigging in 3DS Max? Um, so the logic here, I'll, I'll tell you the same thing I tell everybody that asked this question about modeling. And, and if I use a... Uh, if I use a uh, a analogy here, it'll uh, it'll make things make a little bit more sense. So if I asked you, uh, you know, one day at the school, uh, to take my my dry erase marker and go up to the board and uh, and draw me, uh, you know, a human face, um, you know, you could probably take that marker up, and whether you know whether you do a happy face or you know, you get more realistic with it or whatever. Like you've got, you've got a frame of knowledge. You've got a set of, uh, of rules. You've got a set of, uh, of ways that you work that are going to make it so that you know what you're doing. And if I then ask you to take a sketchbook with a uh, pencil and I asked you to, again repeat the exercise draw a human face well you will again draw that human face and again you may go realistic you may go cartoony like who knows what your skill set is but the the point here is that you're going to end up with a similar face drawing on both the whiteboard with the dry erase and the uh the sketchbook with a uh the sketchbook with a uh, a marker or a pen or whatever, and and that's kind of the same thing with rigging. Whether you're doing it in Blender or Maya or Max, um, you know everybody argues one way or the other about one software being better, and uh, and it's funny like it's it's so prevalent in our industry that people um, side with one software or the other that when you meet someone who's a modeler for the first time. They'll always ask you that question, like, oh, are you a Max or, uh, or a Maya? 
and uh, and I find that absolutely hilarious um, because I'm 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 not I'm not either. Um, you know, when it comes to when it comes to modeling, um, give me a software package and I'll model. You know, like I I know the rules of modeling. I know I know the process of modeling. Learning where they keep the extrusion button doesn't affect my abilities in any way. And I think you'll find that when it comes to rigging, um, you know, the, the skill set that you have already, that is going to carry over into any software you go into. You know, you know how constraints work. Um, you know how parenting works. You know how the hierarchy works. You know how to link things together. You know, you know when to use a IK versus FK. Like, you know how to do all of this stuff. You know the, the logic is there. You know how to rig. The difference in the tools is is minimalist at that point. Um, you know, you go into Max and there's a there's a bone tool here. If I just go to my front view here, so I can go create bones, right? Click, 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 and there I've got a I've got a foot. And you know, I take the rootmost bone and I can go into the uh, animation and IK solvers and let's do a limb solver and I'll just click down on the foot. And now I've got an IK chain, right? And that's good to go. Like that's that's not any more complex or different than what's in Maya. It's just where the tools are. And in some cases, what the tools are called, right? Max calls them bones. <clears throat> Excuse me. Max calls them bones and, you know, Maya calls them joints. But like the, the IK and how that system is set up is identical. And you get your... Your blend shapes are the same. Like nothing, nothing that you do is native to a software. Um, and you could probably find all the same stuff inside of Blender. I say probably because I don't Blender, um, but I'm you know, under the assumption that they're they're doing exactly what uh, what Auto, Autodesk does. And so um, it 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 is one of those things that once once you have that skill set, once you've developed the ability to do something, it doesn't matter where you do it. You can bounce back and forth. And uh, and again, I, I do that constantly with my my skills here. I am uh, constantly going from Max to Maya to ZBrush, and you know I go where the the tool takes me. Now the one downside about your uh, particular particular field is that rigs don't carry over, right? Uh, if you rig a character in in Maya, you can't bring that rig into another software. All of the linkage, all of the um, parenting the hierarchy carries over but you know constraint systems and all of the ik nodes and any kind of uh if this then that type of scripting like all of that is is locked into a software package um but if you can do it in one you can do it in another uh it's just a, the you know the amount of time it'll take you to get used to where the system is and how the system works in the new in the other software and so yeah i hope that makes sense I think I did a really bad job of uh, splitting this guy. I think I've got way too many splits. I think I might just leave that door like that and call it done enough and uh, do the rest in the other software. That is, it is truly how I how I see the software. It's truly how I how I see this stuff. You know, once you're once you're good at this stuff, you're you're good at this stuff. It doesn't matter where you do it. You know, knowledge knowledge is transferable. You know, you can write a novel in, in Microsoft Word, or you can write it in a notepad, you know, or you can write it on, you know, notepad on a computer. Um, like that doesn't it doesn't change your ability to understand how a story is structured. And you've got a particular skill set already in in your ability to rig and that doesn't go away you know how you created your custom rig and whatnot you know you might you might know python and uh and mel um and have no idea how max script works but again like that's just it's learning syntax right you already know what to do when you script you just uh you don't yet know the language in which you are going to be scripting and that is such a a minimalist hurdle to get over. Um, it's also one of the things I find very few students truly understand is that, you know, when you take a class at, you know, a school for, for game development, 
you, you're not taking a class in, you know, learning how to rig in Maya and or how to model in 3ds Max. You're you're taking a class in how to rig or how to model, um, and you should be able to transfer that skill set anywhere uh, as long as you're you're knowledgeable enough in uh, in in what it is that you've been taught. You should be able to bring it anywhere. Um, I often throw my students for a loop when I do that because I'll uh, I'll say, hey, you know what? This semester we're going to work completely inside of uh, Maya. Um, I also often will ask students, like at the beginning of week one, you know, how many of you guys already have some experience with software X? And if a lot of hands go up, then I'll say, cool, we're not going to use that software. Let's let's do something else. Um, just to try and make sure that, you know, enough people are, are picking up the, the issue, uh, picking up the software. And, and again, one of the problems with that is that what most students hear when you say, okay, you know 3ds Max, cool, let's use Maya all semester. What most students hear is, oh, I gotta start over, and that's that's not the case. You don't have to start over at all. But uh, nonetheless, that is what some students hear. But anyway, yeah, long answer short, it's not it's not difficult. It's just a matter of learning the tool. Um, and again, this is this is where you'll kind of excel is if you start, um, yeah, if you start looking at tutorials for, <coughs> excuse me, for rigging in 3ds Max, um, you're going to find that you're probably ahead of most of the tutorials. And that's because you already know, you know, what, what a IK FK switch is on a, on an arm rig. Whereas a tutorial isn't just going to show you how to rig. Uh, and like how to how to mechanically like build the bones and link them together, but it's going to try and teach that stuff as well. And so you know, doing a couple of tutorials like that, man, you'll you'll fly through that stuff. Okay, well, I think this guy's done. Let's see, looks good, looks good, looks good, 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 good. Oh, all of these pipes need a split at the back. This. And this, Let's see, back. Hey, Christian, how you doing, brother? Welcome to the party, pal. Let's see, uh, those are done enough, I think, oh, I think anyway, uh, let's do this guy. So I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to take a shortcut here, Christian, from what I was doing yesterday in that, uh, I have to re-unwrap this thing and, uh, I think that the longer I put it off, the angrier I'm going to get at the mesh. And so I figured I'd, I just bite the bullet and go and, uh, unwrap the damn thing now. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm trying to take a shortcut. So because I unwrapped it yesterday, um, and I know where I put all of my UV seams, where where everything was located in the, the first unwrapping, what I'm doing in Max is jumping into uh, all of the edges that were my UV seams, and I'm splitting them. And so what this is doing is it's creating holes in my model. So if I go to element mode here and I select this thing, uh, somewhere, if I go to you, this, um, so you can see, I've actually got holes here and around the model and, uh, and that, uh, no different, different Christian. Different Christian from a different school. Although I can see how you would make a mistake. So in doing this and going and splitting all these edges up here, um, where I know I want my UV seams to go, 
when I bring this into Maya, Maya is going to read these splits as UV Island breaks. And so what that means is that I won't have to create seams in Maya. I can just start unwrapping. So you can see every element here is a UV Island. And the trick to this is that when I bring it back into 3ds Max after it's been UV'd, uh, I'm just going to go and do a weld on all my vertices and all these seams will close up again. And so it's a little bit of a shortcut. I used to do this a lot on models because um, I hated, this is going back a few, a few versions of Max now, um, but I really used to hate the, the tools that Max had for um, edge selection and being able to loop and all that stuff. And so I used to do this a lot, go and break my models up so that uh, I didn't have to use Max's UV editor. Now I'm just going to kind of use it as a shortcut. Let's see, this, uh, I think that, same thing here, this and this two. Okay, split. Let's see if I did that correctly. Yeah, that'll work. And so it's a little bit uh, time consuming uh, in the uh, the onset here of of trying to get this to uh, to work. But in the end, if you do it correctly, and again, I've got better selection tools. Like I just split the back of this thing off, <coughs> which excuse me. Which again would have been a lot longer to select all those edges in uh, in the two D editor, but in Max I can select by angle, click on the back, and I get all of those polygons. And if I hold Shift and click on edges, it gives me the border edge, and then I just hit split and it's done. And so way way faster. It's it's that kind of stuff that man, why is that not in the UV editor? Why why go through all of these stupid hoops? Um, to select things in, in your UVs. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And so anyway, that's what I'm doing here, um, is going through and uh, splitting this stuff off. Trying to uh, give myself a, uh, a decent head start into the UV so that I'm not going to... Oh, what little hair I have left out. Split those two. Should be this edge and this edge. This edge, this edge. And in here and split. And then we're gonna go down in here. And so hopefully, this will speed me up a little bit. So I've got a, uh, I've got a little art director now on my project. It's my son. Uh, every morning, he, uh, he gets up and comes into the studio. And he's, uh, he's very point of fact, Dad, okay, I want to see the changes you've made. Uh, I want to see if the audio is still random. I don't want to see the same sound or hear the same sound in the same place twice. And if he does manage to get the same, actually he found a bug doing that today. Um, but he's very, he's very quick, heavy. Dad, that's not supposed to work that way. Yes, sir, boss, sir. Sorry, sir. I'll fix that as soon as I can. Very, uh, very, very point of fact. And uh, always like, what are you, what are you working on now, dad? What's that supposed to be? Why is that in there? Can I click on this? Why can't I click on this? His big one right now, his biggest complaint right now, is that I haven't built in controller support for this. Um, he doesn't uh, WASD. He's seven. His fingers are really small for a keyboard. Um, and so he just he doesn't WASD. And so when he plays the game, he picks up the, uh, the Xbox controller and he'll play it there. And uh, that's always his... Whoa. That's always his first criticism is, you know, 
Dad, I want to play this with a controller. And I said, yeah, buddy, but I'm, I'm making it for the keyboard right now. I said, if I can later on, I'll put controller support in. Dad, what if some of your students use a controller? I was like, yeah, I get that. Like, I know that's a possibility. Um, and so anyway, yeah, he's very, uh, he's very demanding for a seven-year-old. He's good, man. He's good. I was talking to him today. Um, I'm plugging away, plugging away. We're down to um, almost a month until the release of our game, which uh, is pretty exciting. Uh, anxious to see uh, people's opinions of that, which is uh, always, well, <coughs> not always a good thing. As I'm sure Naughty Dog can tell you, not always a good thing when people get your game in their hands. But, um, uh, let's see. It's really. Okay, how long is this edge? One, two. Five, six curves, so one, two, three, it should be split there. That. So I think this one mesh is going to be limiting in my uh in my packing. So I'm gonna have to watch how that how the UVs on that go. Because it'll definitely you know what? There's no reason for these to be separate meshes. Hey man, they got a stinker on their hands. Uh, I we were talking about this a little bit yesterday, but man, there there are some beautiful things in that game, and the the artwork is almost phenomenal. I don't I don't really much like the character art, but the um the the artwork is phenomenal. Some of the tech that's in there is crazy. Uh, I was going on the other day about the rope physics and how just absolutely mental that is in the game and i and i having played uncharted 4 like i see it as an extension of what they were doing in that game and you can kind of see this this progression that they're making in their uh, in their tool set which is really absolutely fascinating to see but uh but man their writer couldn't write his way out of a paper bag um and that's that's become pretty evident i think the <clears throat> all of the all of the criticism that is leveled at that game is all leveled at the same one person and so yeah it's stupid and i you know i know exactly why they did it i thought um when i heard cuz i i heard that that was happening um back when the leaks happened right that was something that uh, that came out with the leaks <clears throat> And uh, when that happened, uh, it it was very obvious to me why they would go that route. You know, it's it's the it's the shock value. It's the oh my god, I don't want to have to do this, which was a very big hallmark of the first game. I mean, you didn't play any of your antagonists in the first game, um, but it was definitely one of those things that you you felt that same kind of um, emotional uh, connection. But, uh, but man, Neil Druckmann couldn't write his way out of a paper bag. None of his life depended on it. What an absolute asshat that guy is. Um, and it's, it's funny too, because like, to me, The Last of Us is about Joel. Um, you know, that is, he's the character. Ellie was a plot device, you know? She was the, the thing that reminded him of his, of his daughter in the first game, you know? It wasn't this, uh grandiose um thing with you know multiple character arcs um in fact you know ellie very very much has no character arc in that first game um she's the same person you you at the end of the game as she is at the beginning of the game she doesn't really have much of an arc to her but uh but joel's got a very powerful character arc in that game you know dealing with the loss of his daughter and then all of a sudden having this kid thrust upon him 
Um, that's a really, <clears throat> a very heavy, heavy arc. Um, which again, I don't give credit to Neil Druckmann for having done that. He lifted it from somewhere else. Um, that comes from Sin City. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just as powerful there. Um, but, uh, that's what I want. Uh, yeah, we'll do that like that. But yeah, um, I feel bad for a lot of that studio that's getting, you know, such negative press around this game all because of one dude. <clears throat> and that one dude is, you know, kind of the face of the studio, which, again, I think was a mistake on their part. Well, that's the thing, right? It, you're supposed to hate Abby. She's the, she's the antagonist in the story, right? Um, and to make players play as the antagonist, like, I don't want to be this person. Why are you making me this person? Let alone, why does she have, you know, upgradable skills? You know, why? I, I'm not going to upgrade her. Fuck her. And, and, and that's, that's where the problem lies, is that, you know, people don't care about the person that they're portraying. And that makes for a very big problem. Uh, you know, when they're, when people are playing your game, if they hate the character that they are, you know, what, what's going to drive them to continue playing? You know, you get to a, a save point where you're playing as this, this other character that everybody hates. Why would you bother turning the game back on? You know, what's going to bring you back? The hope that you might end up being, being, you know, It's just, it's just bad. It's just bad. Just bad. And, uh, and I don't think he's, he's got a clue that it's bad. Um, and I mentioned, you know, I talked about this a little bit yesterday too. You know, I think it was incredibly insensitive to, uh, release a game, um, during the pandemic that is about a pandemic where, People's lives have been lost during this thing. And, uh, and, and what, I'm going to go fucking play a game now? The same thing happens. You know, I, I, feel, I feel for people who had grandparents die because of this or parents die. Um, and then Sony releases a game that's a little too on the nose. You know, it just feels... It feels out of touch. It feels a little, a little cold. And so, I think there's that side of things, too. And I thought they had done the right thing. I really did think that they were, they were reconsidering the launch when they, uh, when they delayed it. Um, when they were saying, like, look, uh, there's a fucking pandemic. We're going we're gonna to not put this out. Um, but no, they just didn't want people lining up at stores, uh, which was the, again, that's mental that they would do that. But yeah, we'll see we'll see where things go in the future for them. Um in terms of how Naughty Dog pulls out of this. Uh my understanding is that this is the last last of us game that they're they're not doing another one. I had I didn't think they should have made this one. The first game stood on its own well enough. But um I can understand uh, if they if they want to go back to that back to that well again. No, is that uh, Mafia One? Is that going to be uh, PS PS Five? I saw the PS Five announce uh, announcement reveal nonsense that they did. I don't remember the Mafia being part of that though. Uh, I disagree, Cirrus. I don't think that this should have been Ellie's game. I don't think Ellie should have had a game. Ellie was not a Ellie was not a strong character. She was a plot device, and uh, and I think that um, 
I think that was that was one of the mistakes that they went down that route. There's there's no depth to her, and uh, and I think that's one of the things that that irritated me about this game. But yeah, if they get um, what am I doing here? FBX. Uh, this is the furnace. We'll jump into Maya. Am I speaker setting correctly here? Um, let's open the Maya. Yeah, I I don't know where that studio is going to go from now. Like they're they're in new IP territory, right? Because uh, Neil Druckmann destroyed Uncharted, and there's nowhere left to go with there. Um, they had they had always planned on this being the end of Nathan Drake's story, but uh, but Druckmann's attempt at another Uncharted type story in that universe uh, fell flat on its face. Um, which I don't, you know. I don't know why they thought that was a good idea. And so we'll see where we'll see the studio where the studio goes from here. Um but they're gonna have they're gonna it's like they're in new new IP territory. Um unless of course uh Jack and Daxter uh, comes back, which again was the game that the first Last of Us was supposed to be. And so we'll see, we'll see. Who knows where that studio is going to go? No, I thought Uncharted 4 was stupid. It was one of the worst written games I've ever played. Again, visually stunning. The artwork is incredible. Really neat tech in the game. But in terms of story, it was just stupid. Um, it was like it was like Druckmann never bothered to play the original Uncharted games to learn any of what had happened before. The the retcon as a plot device is is one of the biggest indicators that your writer sucks. Having to go back and retroactively change the past of stories that have already been told in order to make the story that you're telling make sense um, is an indicator that your writer doesn't know what he's doing. And and that's exactly what most of the premise around Uncharted 4 was. Oh, there's a brother you never knew about. When we've already seen young um we've already seen young Drake, and he was raised on the streets by himself until Sully found him. You know, this was a major uh, point of Uncharted 2. And uh and then Druckmann goes and rewrites that and is like, no, 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 no. He wasn't just alone on the streets. He had a brother. We just didn't see him until now. Uh, which is exactly, that's the, it's the dumbest thing in the world. Um, and again, it indicates that the, the writer didn't know what to do with the story, didn't have anything to do with this. And so um, the first three Uncharted's are great. They're, they're, they're fun little action games that have, you know, really good plot development, really good character development. The the Nathan Drake and uh, Elena Fisher, um, the the relationship that changes over time between those characters, you know, uh, it evolves throughout the stories where, you know, they just met each other at the very beginning of the very first game. And then they're married, you know, come come the end of it. Like that is a very beautiful arc. And and where did Neil Druckmann take it in part four? They're still married. And it's like that there's no evolution there there's no there's no evolve uh evolving there's nothing there's nothing you know crazy that no character building in any way they're they're exactly the people they were the last time well if they're exactly the people why do i give a fuck why why you know character development is is the main reason for writing stories seeing the arcs that characters go through and uh and that's that's completely you know what was missing there and uh and it's one of the things that that you know again i think illustrates just how how poorly this guy is uh creating these stories how poorly his stories are written um and then again he does the same and and if you want to <clears throat> excuse me you want an example of how lame this is <clears throat> compare it to what it looked like in um, 
uh, in Harry Potter, right? Think of the end of Harry Potter and how stupid it was when you're like, look, it's all grown up Harry Potter and oh, he's got a kid and how lame that was. Like what a stupid way to end your story. And that's exactly what they did in this. They went down that same road of, you know, bum, bum, bum. They had a kid. And man, it's just so stupid. You know, if I, if my, I asked my children, you know, oh, what do you think the future of this character would be? You know, that's something that a seven-year-old thinks of. They got married and had a kid. Like, there's no, there's no anything worth telling in that story. Um, and then even to have the, uh, even to have the, uh, the character, the, the kid then be playable is just, it was stupid. Here, you want an example of, of how, um, of how good Uncharted could have been? So, there is a, and this actually comes from the end of, uh, sorry, not Uncharted, The Last of Us. Um, there's a uh, a poster in the daughter's room in um in uncharted that is a last of us comic book poster and it's one of the covers from one of the i think it's dark horse comics that did them uh one of the series of comics that was released uh that lived you know after the first game came out it was it was kind of trying to flesh out that world a little bit which you know this is a great, great idea. It's a brilliant world, and it should be fleshed out. Um, yeah, the problem is that who gives a fuck about his daughter? Um, and again, he, he also tried to go Uncharted without Drake um, in that other game that nobody nobody cared about. And so, I don't know. It's like saying, you know what? I'm going to make an Indiana, mo an Indiana Jones movie. And I'm going to make Shia LaBeouf his son. And then let's follow Shia LaBeouf instead of Indy. Same fucking thing. And, and it really just illustrates how bad people are writing that they just kind of keep dipping into that same inkwell again. You know, what makes Nathan Drake a, an interesting character is his upbringing. You know, the fact that he's this... He's Aladdin. He's a street rat that that ended up, you know, being a treasure hunter. And, and you know, that kind of character development is brilliant. You know, going from this, you know, thing, thinking you're the, the, the descendant of this treasure um, hunter or this, this pirate who had, you know, wealth of treasure. That is a really good story arc. But if you look at the story arc for his daughter, you know why that, why that game fails. The story arc of his daughter is, my dad did this. There's, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. There's no story. My dad did this, so now, so do I. Like, it's... Who cares? Ah, you're making excuses, Ian. You're making excuses. Ladies and gentlemen, we got a Harry Potter fanboy in the house. <laughs> poorly written. Poorly, poorly written. Actually, uh, we just watched on the weekend <clears throat> uh, Percy Jackson and the Olympians. Because uh, it was Father's Day, and I wanted to do something with my kids, and uh, I don't, I don't Harry Potter. I just can't subject myself to that, and so in the end, I subjected myself to Harry Potter by watching uh, Percy Jackson, which is just more Harry Potter. Same freaking thing. There was really a, uh, there was really a. Uh, a, uh, whatchamacallit, <clears throat> a uh, frame, a guideline for writing YA stuff 
that it seems like every author who did uh, followed, you know, your your Harry Potter, your Percy Jackson, your Maze Runner, like all of these things. They're they're so interchangeable with one another that they're uh, you know they practically, if they don't already have the same um, story beats, you know, they're 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 all interchangeable. And again, it's because somebody found that formula, right? Somebody found, and and, and I'm not blaming uh, J.K. Rowling for that. She she obviously didn't find the formula. She just reused the formula. Um, that formula goes goes back eons. Um, but uh, you know, George Lucas used the same freaking thing. Um, Hunger Games, same deal. Hunger Games, Jesus Christ. And, oh, my wife got so into Hunger Games. I'm like, but it's so bad. Um, so unoriginal. And, uh, once again, um, they're all just kind of, they're, they're, re, they're reissues, right, of the same story arc. The same character developments, the same... Over and over and over and over and over and over. And it's it's never any different. You know, you just get these characters that are uh retellings of each other. You know, there's there is very little different between Potter and Skywalker. You know, those two those two guys are the same thing. Um you know, you've got the 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 young boy whose parents are gone, living with the aunt and uncle that don't really understand his importance in the universe. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrible, 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 terrible. I don't know why that, that happened all of a sudden. That YA stuff just got stupid. I mean, when I was, like, I don't know, a teenager and stuff like that, I just read fucking comic books. You know? I didn't read YA stuff. Um, what the hell is going on? Something screwy with these meshes. They're... Their seams keep going back. I think there's a problem with this mesh. This might have been what pooched my UVs yesterday. One of the meshes here, the hinges, no matter what I do to them, they don't UV. They keep kind of like master resetting back. Okay, let's try and get them in the right place here. These ones are here. That's my cursor. These ones are here. And let's go and attach these ones and then place these there. Should put them in the right place. And comic books, I mean, okay, there is a fair amount wrong with comic book writing. And, you know, uh, very weak writing in, in a lot of places. You know, how many times <clears throat> do I need to reread the origin story of a superhero that's been around for fucking 70 years? I get it. I don't need a rehash of that. And you find this just about everywhere, right? Where... Um, they retell the same story over again. And I don't, I don't think that's, that's good storytelling. And you often hear the excuse of like, oh, well, it's for the next generation. Like, I don't know, my kid's never read a fucking Superman book, but he can tell you Superman's origin story. You know, we, we don't need another movie about it. We don't need another comic about it. We just need good writing. And it seems like whenever these writers are stuck and, uh, and can't come up with something solid, they go back and, and dip that pen back into the same 
and dip their quill back into the same ink pot again. And you end up with another retelling. And, and you know, this has followed comic books for a long time. Actually, Ian, I read something today. Get this. Uh, so there was a leak at Marvel that um, some some insider who I guess had a lot of correct information on previous Marvel movies um, has now said that he has information that, um, yeah, I got to do it again, Bray. Uh, has said, this insider has said that he's got information that there is a Mark Ruffalo Hulk movie coming and that in that Hulk movie, they are going to be introducing the mutants via Wolverine fighting the Hulk. Which I was like, okay, okay, I see what you did there. Um, and apparently what, what the story revolves around, uh, how the story revolves around Wolverine is that he is uh, he is on the run from a government agency, so he's not he's not like instant good guy, and he's not just like low life. But they're gonna make him on the run from a government agency, and the X Men kind of help him to escape, um, which ends up getting him pitted up against the Hulk. The government agency that's going after him is going to be Alpha Flight, and Marvel has said that they don't think Alpha Flight's gonna be strong enough to carry a movie on their own. However, if they are well received in the uh, in the Hulk movie, they may get a Disney Plus TV show of Alpha Flight. And I was like, man, that's kind of cool. I like I like kind of where they're going with that. Alpha Flight without Wolverine, though I could I could imagine. That if you had a Alpha Flight TV show and you had just hired yourself a new Wolverine, uh, that you know you could work it into his contract that you know you have seven uh, season one and two appearances to make. Um, but who knows? Uh, it all sounded it all sounded rather interesting to me. Um, they've got to get on their horses here to do something with the MCU because their their key players are gone and they need to uh, start filling in filling in those voids left um i think hemsworth's got one movie left one or two movies left and uh we end up we end up at a at a marvels yeah yeah the thing that i read said that alpha flight was just going to be pursuing uh wolverine so he had escaped some government facility presumably in canada and Alpha Flight was the team that went in to go hunt him down. And uh and it's the X-Men that pull him out. It sounds it sounds very much like burn stuff. And so uh, you know, we'll we'll see where that leads. So here are the uh here are the fruits of my labor. And uh and again, it looks like what I was planning in uh in 3DS Max, uh in terms of uh lining this stuff up here has worked quite nicely. Um, it has, I'm going to have to straighten everything out, which will take a few moments, but, uh, it did, all of those splits did give me, uh, usable islands that I'll be able to do. So I'm going to have to go in, uh, and weld this thing together once I get it out of here. Uh, I'm also going to not remove it from max until I'm sure that it's, everything's copacetic. Yeah, I don't know about WandaVision. I I can kind of see where they're going with it, and uh, and it looks like it's funky. The only reason I'm going to check it out is that I fucking bought Disney Plus, and I feel like i got to justify the money somehow. Um, and also, um, I'm afraid of them introducing another uh, MCU character in, in that show that I won't, like, that'll appear in the movies, and I, I will be like, wait, who, who the fuck's this guy? Where? Well, I mean all know who that guy is, but I won't know why all of a sudden he's in the thing. And so um, I feel like, like I've got to do that. And also I feel like I need to watch it because the Mandalorian's not back yet. And uh, I mean, I need, I need me some Mandalorian. I'm, I'm not only am I going to not 
<laughs> not only am I going to not save it, but I'm going to reboot the computer here while I'm doing the UVs. We'll see how that works out. The funny thing is, I did save my file. Um, I exported it, right? I actually created um, I created a file, and it still, it still went all crappy on me. Um, some of the UVs here, some of the UVs did not do as they were told. This shape here. Ooh. That's two of them? Oh, that means I forgot a seam somewhere. I don't know how that was possible. Prettiest max loop, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let's try that again. Unfold. There we go. That guy's better. Actually, might as well straighten it out while I'm here. Bum 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 bum. I've actually been reading some pretty cool things about Mandalorian um, last couple of days uh, that I thought were really really cool. Um, the the final shot of the final episode. Uh, when all the stormtroopers show up to give them hell, um, they they didn't have enough stormtroopers for that. They had banked on thirty stormtroopers being there, and uh, and they had costumes for thirty. And when they got them, you know, in front of camera and ready to go, they were like, "Man, thirty thirty is not a lot of stormtroopers." And they were trying to find a way of getting more. They didn't have any more stormtrooper costumes. And so what they did is they reached out to the uh, 501st Legion, the large collection of uh, cosplayers that try very hard to get screen-accurate um, Star Wars costumes, usually Stormtrooper, but uh, there's collections of other things in there. Uh, I apparently did not break that up correctly. Um, and so, yeah, so they have these really you know beautiful screen-accurate costumes. And so what they did is they put a call out. Um, they put a call out to the 501st and said, listen, we need stormtroopers uh, for our show. And, uh, and we don't have any. Would you guys be willing to come down? Like, obviously, they paid them uh, salary for extras. But they all came down and they're like, the other thing is you, you got to bring your own costume. Uh, you can be in Star Wars, but you've got to bring your own costume. Um, which, again, you know, there are so few people that are like, fuck it, I'm ready to go. Um, but the 501st Legion was, they were not only ready to go, but they had their own costumes. And uh, it was Dave Filoni who, uh, who told them uh, at some point after shooting, he was like, listen, guys, you don't, uh, you don't just have screen-accurate costumes now. You have screen-used costumes now. And uh, and to the five hundred first, like they they lost their minds uh, with that, which is like, that's just that's such cool nerd dem for them. Um, it's kind of one of those kind of feel good stories uh, that uh, goes along with like almost everything I've heard about the production of that show. Um, the other thing that I heard that I thought was really cool about that show, uh, Taika Waititi, who did the. Uh, uh, Thor Ragnarok film, and also did uh, a couple of episodes of The Mandalorian. Um, he would take breaks from directing to go and, like, old baby Yoda, like it was actually a baby, even though, you know, it's this prop that's on set. Um, and he would hold it like it was a child. Um, and, uh, and when asked about that, like, what, dude, what... <laughs> What's up with you and the doll? Um, his answer was absolutely brilliant, which is he's trying to humanize the character and trying to treat it as much like a human being as he could allows him to do that. When he treats this, this puppet as a human being, it allows him to then film it in a way that he, he's treating it like an actor instead of just a an effects prop or something like that. It's like, dude, that's magical. I don't buy it. I think you're just snuggling Baby Yoda, but uh, that's that's pretty magical.
apparently Mark Hamill is in uh, is in the Mandalorian. Um, when he heard what the Mandalorian was going to be, he uh, he deemed it necessary that he be in it somewhere. And so I don't know what role he has, but uh, it's probably something under a helmet, maybe a stormtrooper or something like that. Exactly. Okay, let's see how we're doing here. I know a lot of these uh, curvy bits I straightened out yesterday. Uh, apparently when I did some of my breaking in Max, I broke areas that should not have been broken. And we're going to need to revisit those. And all of these bolts, I thought this was a really clever way of uh, unwrapping these screws, but now that I see them, I think I might have made a mistake. Let's see how this lines up. Some more news. Let's see, what is that? What are you? Why do I have three polygons? Oh, uh, you're you're inside there. I get it. I get it. I know what you are. Um, problem is, I don't know where the rest of you is. Okay. <sighs> so even even trying to do this in a way that made sense in 3ds Max, it still produced a bunch of gobbledygook everywhere here. Um, that I'm going to have to stitch up. Well, I'm trying to do that here now. I want to make sure that I'm not stitching anything. I don't want stitched. Edit mesh, uh, and merge. Okay. So, I should have a seam back there, which means this, 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 and this can all stitch together in here. Okay, that one works. Looks like the only broken one. I'm hoping. Only broken anywhere else. Uh, okay, back to object mode. Uh, isolation. Ram the whole damn thing again. And we'll unfold this sucker. And straighten that out. Uh, I'm running out of good TV to watch. I went back and started uh, started watching Vikings. I had watched it uh, when season one was initially released, and uh, and I fell in love with the show. It was absolutely brilliant, but uh, but with only one season, like I I went through it really really quick, and then I was like, oh, there's no more of that. And so when season two came out, I stayed away from it and uh, and didn't watch it. And ditto with season three, and I kind of let a couple of them uh, load up in the backlog, so that I'd have uh, I'd have the ability to kind of watch them together um, and make a run through it. The problem is that you can't do that with really good shows because someone somewhere will ruin it for you. You know, you couldn't um, you couldn't put away Breaking Bad and like, oh, I'm gonna watch I'm gonna watch this later once you know. It, Stories fleshed out a little bit. Uh, doesn't doesn't work that way. Uh, Vikings. Very much like me to Vikings. It is uh, it is a really really good show. And they did some some fantastic things on that show. Isolate this guy. I've got something that is up here and I can't figure out what it is this one polygon here something something is up that's why I can't straighten it the straighten bends it uh straighten orient there that'll work Uh, where are you? Not so much. 
Got this tiny little thing here. I don't know why I broke that up. Yeah, the Last Kingdom's uh, supposed to be pretty good too. But there's definitely a uh, definitely a shortage. Some really good things to watch right now. It doesn't sound like we're gonna get any uh, that much relief from it either. Um, Thirteen. Oy vey, 13. Okay. The mesh merge. Two. That's, that's a little much. Okay, that gave me four. Two, four. That's good. I just need something, something good that has, uh, a bunch of seasons already. Sure, fix it. I don't, oh, bastard. Let's not do that again. Okay, all of this. Oh. Okay, so that, that broke everything. Vertices, and a mesh, merge. Should be. And I weld this now. I can weld this now. Will you unfold? Are you broken. Oh, son of a bitch. Four vertices. Uh, Ian, have you watched uh, Titans? Hannibal's good. I, I've already seen Hannibal. We did a, uh, we did a run here. Uh, Mads Mikkelsen is just killer. Uh, but we we did a run here in my house with um, not just um, not just Hannibal, but uh, Red Dragon and Silence of the Lambs and uh, and all of all of all of them there, all of them there flicks. Mm, True Detective is good too. My problem with True Detective was in season one. I had a really hard time telling the two guys apart. Woody Harrelson and what's his uh oh what's his name? Um all right, all right, all right. That guy. Um I couldn't tell them apart. I think those two are from like two towns that are beside each other in the same state. And and I'm, for the love of me, I just could not tell them apart in the show. Um, part of it is that I, I watch a lot of TV while I'm working too, right? And uh, and that complicates my life. Um, Ian, you didn't like Titans. I really like Titans. I it took me a while to get into it, but there was uh, there was some some good stuff there in the end. McConaughey. McGinnotti. Matthew McGinnotti. <laughs> McConaughey. McConaughey. All right, all right, all right. You know the guy, the guy, the guy would steals Oscars from Leo DiCaprio. That guy. Hey, why are you split? That shouldn't be a split. Somehow I managed to split more vertices up there. And the shortcut I took is taking me down a path down which I cannot return.
Oh Jesus, fuck nuts. You can you can co <laughs> quote me on that. Uh it does you you gotta let it you gotta let it you gotta let it fester a little while. It does get better. They did, especially since Honk is just Batman. Um that really bothered me. Um, but there is there is some really good character development that happens, and in season two, um, they introduced a couple more Titans, and they did their story arcs in a way that was just brilliant. Um, I'm hoping not, Christian. I think I think what had screwed up the uh, the UVs yesterday was the uh, was actually an error in the geometry. Um, Maya doesn't put up with shit, but. Uh, on occasion, you can sneak stuff around it. Okay, if I select these two, that's one vertex, and this is one vertex. Okay, and then up here, one vertex. So if I select like this, there are two edges. And here, two edges. So I think there's something funny here, where these things need to be welded. Um, and I don't think this is the kind of thing that I can do. Hey! How you doing, Terry? Been a long time, my dear. The same hill is going on here. Okay, two. Should mean weldable and weldable. There, that one's done. What the fuck is this? Okay, why is this not unfolding? Go and do this. Mesh. Merge. Okay. Now I should be able to. That. And this guy. Unfold. Don't fix. Don't fix. Something else incredibly broken on this. Oh, yeah. Why is that there? Okay. New plan. All of this. And wherever the hell that thing is. That. And wherever that polygon. Sure, what happened when I split this? But it's causing issues now. So we're going to go and split it back together again. Let's make sure this is low enough that no evil happens. I'm going to go back to my polygons. And I'm the whole damn thing again. I'm going to do a box on this. And hopefully get it close enough. Aren't bad. A couple extra edges here. Oh, thanks. That's very, very sweet of you. Uh, you're going to need alien creature kind of model, by the way. Uh, nope. I haven't. I haven't got anything alien. Um, I will at the end of the um, at the end of the next year, because I'm going to be doing that with my class. But, uh, but yeah, no, nothing, nothing has gone that way for me. I'm sorry to say. I'll split that. And I'll split this. Split, I say. We'll try and merge everything back up here. That split and shouldn't have. Do 
through here, go through here. Uh, seam that up. Same thing down here. Seam that up. And I think... Shouldn't be able to unfold this again. God damn it. Still. That's got non-manifold. That's got... Fuck it. Fix it. I don't care. Okay, this... That's got to be welded. That's got to be welded. I don't know that this was faster at all. Because a couple of pieces that I fucked up ended up messing up the whole goddamn train. Oh, don't unfold an edge. Orient to the edge. Well, that... I think this will unfold a little. So, line these two. No. Yes. Okay. What else is broken in here? Oh, God damn it. That. That. That, this, that the whole thing, that's the whole thing, son of a mother's lunch. So same deal here, I can get this welded back together again, you and you weld. You and you, you, oh, this needs to be, merged again. Okay. This, 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 this. weld. This, this, that's split already. It's fine. That one's okay. So I should be able to, hopefully, without. There we are. Now I just want that little guy. Go back whence he came. You should be. He'll fix that, that, and that. Okay, unfold again. There we go. One end. Oh. One more unfold. Okay. Try this again. Uh, I'll orient to edges. So if you didn't know this, Gary, the live streaming is something I've been doing pretty consistently for the last little while. And uh, I've been doing it in the evenings here while everybody's working from home. Um, weeknight evenings, I've been doing it. And uh, going about three or four hours or so until either I fall asleep at the keyboard or... Uh, I doth get commanded from the wife that it's bedtime. Or I do what happened yesterday and screw something up really good. At which point I give up and I go to bed. But uh, other than that, I've been going. So if you remember, uh, Terry, when you did, uh, when you were in my class, you, in the first week of class, uh, you played a game that we use to define what character you were going to be working on uh, for the duration of the semester. And that little game that you played is what I'm doing here now. Um, building a similar game type uh, system for the students in the, uh, in the semester I have now.
That's the idea. We keep you people motivated. You watch me work and you feel you feel bad, like, oh man, I should work. look at look at how hard Topher works. I should really be doing something. Wasting my life away here. Look at this. But anyway, yeah. Um And so yeah. I've been doing this uh pretty consistently here for the last little while, and uh it's gone gone pretty well. And so uh yeah, you can come come check it out. Let's do another merge. Bring the amount down again so I don't inadvertently weld anything that I don't want welded. And I'll go back uh, to this. You're going to do the whole damn thing now, aren't you? I know. I'm... Okay, let's uh, fuse that. See how much of that it grabs. That's almost the whole thing. Uh, do, 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 do. That one? Nope. That one? Nope. That one? Nope. Yorp. Um, so I'm going to do a box on this. Like I did the others. And then uh, this, this, and this. Without these guys, that one's fine. Without these guys, a planer, which will speed that up. Oop, or fix it, why not? So I normally don't allow Maya to fix my non-manifold topology, and uh, I think that's what bit me in the ass yesterday. Um, is, is not the, uh, is not the, uh, the not allowing it, but the allowing it. I think in fixing some of my topology, Maya done fucked up. And uh, inadvertently created an issue uh, where there wouldn't have typically been one. Um, Maya's got some very specific rules for topology and what can and cannot exist in 3D. Which is all fine and dandy. Like I'm I'm for I'm all for rules. Rules are good. They make the world go round. However, those rules aren't the same rules as 3DS Max. And that can hurt your brain a little bit. Lambert, I'm just gonna go darken my color here. Eat the default values that are in some of these software packages. I really should just go in and edit the defaults uh, to give me the, the values that I'm happier with. Uh, okay, what in the same hell happened here? This. That. Uh, Ian, did you ever read The Sixth Gun? Going to edges. There we go. Now you're tugging. My uh my kid was looking for something to read the other day and uh it made me it made me pull out the uh the old the old big old Y comic boxes and uh start perusing to uh to try and find something that he could he could read. I mean he's 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 able to read, but uh just trying to find something that would uh Keep him busy a little bit. And uh, and I came across that, and I was like, oh, man, that was such a good book. You should really go back and read that. And uh, I didn't, but uh, it made me think that I should. And so I think I'm going to go back and read it. Though, uh, the spinoffs? There were spinoffs? Really? What were the spinoffs? I don't think I got to the end of the Sixth Gun. I don't think I read it all. But I've been buying. I've been buying my comics digitally now. I use uh, comics, Comicsology, 
And, uh, and so I get them all on my tablet, which is uh, super, super helpful. Not you too. Oh no, you're sealed. Unfold. But yeah, I saw it. I saw it in my comic book box, and I was like, "Oh man, I remember loving that." I should go back and read that again. Oh, okay. Cool. Is it any good? Is it as good as the? Uh, is it as good as the rest of it? Sure, this is welded. There we go. All gowns. I don't need this. Cool. Yeah, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to give him a whirl. I really enjoyed the uh, I really enjoyed the first one or the uh, the the setup book, as it were. It was really uh, really well written. This this and this minus this minus this and minus this. planer unfold. Move you over here. Find an edge. Oh, I'm getting really tired of UVs. Oh, cool. So I always wonder uh, when you when you get to books like that that spawn these uh, these spinoffs, if the intent was always that there was going to be a spinoff. Um. You know that that was that was always what they were going to do, or was it one of those things that while writing it, they're like, "Oh man, this guy is so cool," and the the, the author just like, "I want to, I want, I want to know what else happens to this guy." I'm curious. I'm curious which which way those go, because I've definitely had it where I've been writing stuff and I've been like, "Oh, this is my guy." Uh, you need to seal up. I think that should be good. Unfold edges align this and this. Unfold and there's some broken ass shit in here. Stitch and stitch. And stitch. So I had a uh, I had an adventure today. Um, that was a little unexpected. So. The wife has gone uh, gone to the school, back into work, the last couple of days, uh, both to uh, finish things off at the school, um, to be there for students that need to come in and pick up anything. It's a high school, right? So uh, many graduating students, that's it. Like, they're not coming back. And, uh, and anyway, um, her car... Doesn't currently have air conditioning, uh, for which my heart bleeds, and so I uh, I told her to take mine. I'm not going anywhere, at least until 2021. <laughs> and so I told her like, go just go take mine. That's fine. Uh, I'm not going to need it for anything. And so she did. She took my car to Mississauga, where her school is. And uh, at the end of her classes, at the end of the day, when or not her, not her classes, but the end of her work, uh, doing what she was what she was there to do, um, she went to go get in the car and uh, and come home, and the power steering went out um, as soon as she started it, and so she couldn't steer. Uh, I don't know if you if you youngins have ever driven a car without power steering. Um, but it's a different, it's a different beast altogether. Um, and so she couldn't, she couldn't actually drive it home. And so I got to call four and been like, guess what? My fuck truck's messed up again. You 
in Idgit. Um, it was, it's been less than a week since I had it in for, uh, for fixing because it don't work. And, uh, and something, something else goes wrong with it again. And so I had to, uh, pile the kids into, uh, you, you can steer without it. You absolutely can. But it is a Herculean task, if ever there was one. And, uh, and she was definitely not up for that. Um, and so, yeah, that, that uh, put the kibosh on her plans uh, rather, rather quickly to drive home. And so I had to pile the kids into her vehicle, which uh, I don't know if you heard this a moment ago doesn't have air conditioning and then have to drive all the freaking way down a saga with nothing has no power steering personally as a car guy i love it uh <laughs> 24 by the way well it's one of those things though that like it's it's one of those things that got introduced into cars and then people were like yep yeah, no that's how all cars have to be from now on um and then same thing with, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just brought up manual, right? There are so many people who can't drive a, uh, a stick shift. Uh, to them, it's, it's foreign or, or worse yet, that there's just, uh, there's something missing from the car. Which is uh, another one of those things. I'm, uh, when I teach my kids how to drive, I'm going to go, go rent something with a stick and, uh, and teach them on that. Nice. That's the way cars are supposed to be. Unfold. And let's go and align this guy up. Uh, a couple more line guys here. And I think, other than... Yeah, some of these hinges are broken on these other ones, too. I've got a few little uh, rogue islands here. Islands in the sun uh, that are polygons that I broke off accidentally or on purpose um, when doing this, and it uh, ended up messing up my stuff a lot here. So I've got a few uh, a few ideas for doing this. Uh, if I am happy with this one, which I'm pretty sure I am, since it's the one I just cleaned up, except for that. So this thing is not, this, this is not cleaned up. <laughs> that, that would suck. Driving in Scotland with a stick and trying to not completely stall out. funny though the the things i i look at uh you know how how life has evolved you know uh the difference between my parents generation and my generation and uh and just things that are that kind i really need to model a car in 3d uh -huh, still not tried Yeah, cars are cars are one of those things, man. They uh definitely haven't done it before. It really does help to be uh an aficionado of vehicles. Um when you model them because it will uh absolutely make your life a lot easier if uh if you know what it is, the components and everything, uh when you're modeling them. I modeled a uh, I modeled a Harley Davidson uh, a little ways back, um, and uh, and I had never I mean I I'd, I'd ridden a bike before, um, but was never uh, never really um, aware of what all the the components are and all of that jazz, and uh, and yeah I went and uh, and modeled this thing and it was a. Uh, it was an adventure in uh, in learning 
the mechanics of a motorcycle, you know, the uh, the components that uh, that make up this this vehicle. Um, and I had to go and like I, I couldn't even look up what the components were for modeling it. You know, I had to um, find a diagram that was labeled so that it would tell me what the parts were so that I could then go look up that part to find enough reference for it. Um, and so, yeah, it can get, it can get hella complex, man, when you are, uh, unfamiliar with them, with, uh, with the thing that you're modeling. Um, I've told this to, to students before, Ian, you can probably back me up on this, um, that, uh, you kind of become knowledgeable in areas that you never thought you would be when you start modeling them. You know, when you start looking at, uh, modeling architecture or modeling a, you know, a vehicle or a gun and just getting to the point where you're like, oh, yeah, I, I know what that component is and what it does now. It's really, really different. I'm currently doing a drift track for Assetto Corsa for a group called Electronic Drift Championship that's going well. Getting paid for it as well. Dude, that's awesome. That's, that's living the dream, my friend. Living the dream. That's uh, that's what you want. You want to be doing something you love and uh, and getting paid for it, which is uh, always a good thing. So kudos, good on you, good on you. I modeled the bat pod and rigged it. It was my first rig, and I am not a modeler. <laughs> Nice. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, you so you so learn uh, learn so much when you model things. Um that that bike that I modeled was for uh a project that I was I was looking to get off the ground, a uh, Sons of Anarchy project. And uh and it was the like the lead character's bike. And uh, and I was like, oh, I I love this show, and I want to uh, I want to model this, and and what have you, and uh, what the hell, why is it telling me there's seams where there's no seams? Really confused. Um, and so yeah, so I modeled it from the uh, from the show, and it was the lead the lead character's bike. And uh, it then surprised me uh, watching the show again afterwards because the, the lead character didn't ride the, the same bike all the time. Um, he was kind of bouncing from bike to bike. And I was like, what the hell is going on? And I wondered how much of that happened in shows I watched when I was younger that I didn't notice that they were swapping out make and model of vehicles on the fly. Oh, for this scene, we'd rather have the, uh, the super... Eh. Do that one instead, it'll have a little bit more power. And then we'll go back to his regular car after that. And, you know, nobody really kind of picks up on it. Uh, I wonder how much of that is prevalent that uh, I just didn't pick up on. Because I definitely know, and like, you know, definitely noticed it in this show because I'd gotten pretty familiar with that bike once I modeled it. <laughs> that's that's one of the ones they don't put on the brochure um <laughs> here come come work for us make video games get eaten by bears <laughs> oh game developers how we are an interesting bunch I'm getting some weird artifacts here in that uh, the model is telling me that there are UV seams where there aren't, which I don't understand. I think you go there. No, 
Not there. Not that one. This way. Yeah, it's really bizarre. It's showing me that there's UV seams and I haven't put UV seams. It's it's these errors that are that are scaring me uh, because I don't know if that happened yesterday and I wasn't paying attention and that that's where my model is broken. Um, damn it. This needs to come off. This needs to go back. This needs to unfold. And so I'm wondering if, uh, if while working on this yesterday, in my haste, um, something similar to what happened right now happened then, and I just didn't notice. So Loch Ness yesterday, uh, if you weren't, uh, if you weren't privy to the stream last night, uh, this is my second go at unwrapping this thing. Uh, and I unwrapped it last night, and when I exported it from Maya into 3ds Max, the UVs disappeared. Uh, and I, I don't, I don't know where they went. Uh, there were UVs, you know. I spent half hour, an hour or so unwrapping it, and there were UVs. And I was like, okay, I'm done. Let's go bring this into Max, so we can, you know, move on. I got it in the Max, and the UVs were gone. And I was like, well, that's that's strange. And then I went back into Maya, and the UVs were gone in Maya. It was like they completely reverted to before there were any UVs. And I don't know why. I don't know what happened. And uh, it done pissed me off a bunch. Oh, no. I have a funny feeling. Son of a monkey's lunch. So something, okay, this is why I'm seeing seams where I shouldn't be. Something has gone horribly wrong. I'm going to close the object here. Um, so what has gone horribly wrong is that uh, there are multiples of some meshes, like this one. And I don't know where that came from. I don't know why there would be duplicates. Uh, but this one, no, oh, there's only one of those. Yeah, I don't know what happened, but somewhere along the way, that guy's fine. That guy's already fine. We'll check this. That's fine. So it looks like it was only the one mesh. Yeah, everything else seems to be just one instance. But these doors that I'd been unwrapping, that I was doing those hinges, I wondered why I wasn't making any frickin' progress. Yeah, I must have hit Control D somewhere along the way and uh, and done it. Ah, I tell ya, I tell ya. I'm getting pretty tired of unwrapping this fucking furnace. Okay. So that would be why it was acting so freaking strange. Okay, so what is going on here now? All of this... Yeah, see, I, I think the duplicate that I just deleted was the one that I had already done this side. I'm gonna uh I'm gonna save myself the headache here. So these these doors, these top doors, they're the only doors that are symmetrical. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna save myself some headache here. And I'm gonna delete the door. Jesus. What an object mode. Do it that way. There. And then we'll just mirror the fucking thing. Uh, let's go plus to minus. Okay. 
Screw you, Maya. Not unwrapping it again. Okay, layout. We'll see how well this goes. So, you can't technically mirror, mirror UVs. But what you can do is mirror a geometry that has UVs, and it'll just inherit the UVs from the underlying geometry. So let's go and lay out the whole thing and see how close we are. I've got a couple of little wonky um, sections here and some stuff that's not straightened out. Mm. I think that's the other thing, too, is that there are so many shortcuts in all of these software packages that if you inadvertently hit anything on the keyboard, I always panic. I'm like, oh, my God, what did that just do? What would, oh, shit, save, uh, export, pray, do something. Um, and, and worse yet is a lot of the shortcuts are, are toggles as well, where you toggle something on. And so you might not have noticed anything happen, but you hit this button to turn on something else, and then you hit another button, and it uh, just goes all the way. So we'll see how far this goes and uh, and what the UVs look like. Um, I'm getting to the point where I'm I'm more anxious about getting this thing done than I am worrying about it being perfect. And so we might just... We might just leave it as B. Okay. Uh, it's not fantastic. Let's see about straightening some of the ugly ones. That's good. That could be straightened. This could be straightened. I am definitely getting to the point of giving a fuck less about my UVs than I am about getting them perfect. These two guys here, they're going to waste a lot of space by being all wonky like this. So I'm going to optimize and straighten those. I think this one too. This one... Uh, I'm going to be fine with that. Maybe this one. This one. One more smokestack somewhere. Where are you? Straighten this. There you are. I knew we in here somewhere, so... Okay, let's see. Hopefully there's no quads on this. We're going to go and optimize this a bunch. Ooh, got really ugly really quick. Try and optimize. Let's try and straighten it out a little bit. Let's see what we can do. Straighten that out. Give it a helping hand. This is the one place where I think Max is a little bit better with the UV tools is the uh, the straighten in Max doesn't really care about anything but non-quad topology. Whereas in Maya, even if it is all quads, you'll get really wonky topology if you're not careful. Let's optimize and straighten Optimize and straighten. Optimize and straighten. That one looks good enough. Optimize and straighten. Optimize and straighten. That one looks good enough. Optimize and straighten. That one's good enough. Uh, 
and turned on some shortcut stuff and was like, what the hell? Yeah, my, my favorite, my favorite in all of these software packages, the most mind-numbingly stupid thing that's in any of these packages is this right here. 3DS Max has an icon on the UI that alters your shortcuts. Only fucking thing it does is takes what you know and changes it. What fucking drunk hillbilly monkey thought that was a good idea? Wow, I mean, really fucking productive. I gotta fucking slow the hell down. Where the hell's that button that turns off my UI? What the f... Why would you ever want that? Stupid, stupid software. I don't know why you would ever just turn off your keyboard shortcuts. So stupid. My guess, um, kerosene, is that what you hit was a space bar. This is especially deadly for anyone that uses both Max and Maya. Where in Maya, it is one of the most useful keys, which makes sense. It's also one of the biggest fucking keys on your keyboard. Um, and it switches between your views, right? Very, very useful. Very, very useful. And then you go into 3DS Max, and the biggest fucking button on the keyboard you don't want to hit locks up your UI. Can't deselect, can't reselect. You're just stuck. What kind of drunken idiot came up with that? It's another one of those ones that just, man. Christian, I don't think hard is how they worked on it. I think, I think they, they tested to see what it does and called it a feature. And then, and then they were like done with it. I think that's, I think that's how that worked. It is absolutely mental how that works. Okay, let me go and uh, and spit this sucker out here. Uh, I'm gonna crack open Unreal since it's currently not running, and I want to get my project open. And so I'll go and do that. And uh, with my project open, go launch that. Uh, I'm getting pretty close to wanting to go uh, high poly this thing. Oh, well, that's not bad, Christian. I actually swapped it in Max to do what Maya does, and so it's my it's my uh, my viewport toggle. It actually works exactly the same way it does in both software packages. Um, I've got Convert to Editable Poly as a shortcut in the right-click menu in the quads right here. And the thing that's useful about that is um, is that you, you do both. Uh, it, so these little blue buttons here, they do the last thing you did. So if I go and Convert to Editable Poly, I can then right-click and left-click, and that does the same thing. And so left click, right click is convert to edible poly for me, which is like the fastest thing you'll ever you'll ever come by. Bray's asking about lighting and when I'm gonna do some lighting. So I did mention yesterday that I wanted to uh, alter the lighting in my scene here um, for a couple of reasons. I'm getting uh, I'm getting some points here where uh, it's just too fricking black in the world. And, uh, and I'd like to clean it up uh, to a point that you, you can see everything in the world. Um, you're also going to see this problem here. If you look at my garlic, um, you'll see that as I, as I back away from the garlic, it appears to start glowing. Um, and so this is, this is another problem that I've got to address. This is all lighting, uh, lighting based here that I need to fix. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the other thing, too, right, as you get used to it. Um, as an instructor, teaching this stuff as my primary 
<sighs> my prim primary form of uh, making a living. I can tell you that custom shortcuts suck sometimes. Uh, they make sense. They're good. It's very useful to make the software do your bidding. But uh, man, oh man, man, oh man, can it really suck when a student is like, sir, what's the button that does this? And you're like, I don't fucking know. I uh, changed all my shortcuts and uh, <laughs> I don't know. Are you talking about the garlic, Ian? The uh, dynamic lighting? I'll show you what I'll show you. It's, it's light bleed from my uh, directional light. It's a stupid mistake um, that I've got to fix, obviously. It's, it, it, you'll see there's, there's errors in a lot of places. Uh, that one in particular is bad, though. So let me overwrite the furnace. I'm not going to do anything in Maya. We're going to leave Maya exactly the way it is. And I'm going to delete the furnace from Max and then re-import it. Uh, furnace. And hopefully, hopefully UVs come with me this time. So let's go take a look. Yay! There are UVs. Magical. Um, so yeah. The issue that I'm getting here is, uh, is the, uh, the light bleed. So this is my dynamic light casting light on this object, even though the dynamic light is outside and somewhere over yonder. That's also what's going on here on the feet of this thing, um, which is just messed. Now, the reason that that's happening is that when, so the, the entire room, when I first built it, I built it in Max and, uh, and used a shell modifier. So it's a completely self-contained object, right? There's, there's thickness to the walls and there's an outside to the walls. But I ended up splitting the floor off and making the floor its own mesh. And so the floor, which also has a shell modifier on it, has a bottom. But when I split the, sh the floor off from the walls, the walls no longer have a bottom to them. So they're open at the bottom. And that's what's causing the light bleed inside to affect this thing. And so the only the only fix for this is to um, actually go seal up that that room that mesh. And so uh, that should be uh, something to uh, be able to fix quite easily. All right, all right, so I hope anyway. Um, but yeah, here's here's yesterday's version of this thing with no UVs. Um, living in its home, in its spot. And that's the one I'm going to replace here. Yeah, I thought of doing the BSP walls to, uh, to just to block out the light. Um, however, the, um, the issue with that is that I still want, like, holes for the light. And I don't want to, like, punch holes in the BSP. Um, I think what I'm going to end up doing, and you can actually see here that this is the issue, if I turn off the directional light, and the light bleed goes away. That's super useful, but y you know what else is really super useful? The fucking dynamic light doesn't do anything. The only thing it's doing is A, blowing out all of my little meshes, and it's providing for me this little bit of lighting on the floor, which again, I wanted to do volumetric lighting with that, but you're not actually going to see anything once I build the mesh that goes around the windows anyway, so... Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my directional light here and I'm going to delete the fuck out of it. And then we're going to save. That is going to fix the light bleed. You'll see the garlic doesn't blow out anymore, uh, which is useful and it's good. Uh, it's not a, I mean, it's not a brilliant solution. If, if you were able to actually go outside in this house, that would be a problem. Uh, you can also see them getting light bleed along other places too. Um, again, where these meshes meet one another. Uh, and so I, I'm going to have to seal these up. Um, this is still my proxy, the, uh, the walls here, the mesh that I'm using. This is, it's still called proxy floor. So when I built the, uh, the, the room originally, um, you know, I, I didn't get to a point where, uh, I ended up splitting the floor off. Um, I didn't end up renaming this mesh. I haven't built proper walls yet. I didn't actually, I haven't UV'd these walls. Uh, I just put a uh, planar map or a uh, flattened map in Max. And so they, they still need to get fixed. I've got my proxy stairs too, which don't even have UVs. This is just one box repeated, you know, into the shape of stairs. And so 
Uh, I have to go and do that. I think those are the only proxy meshes. I try to name my meshes. I don't know if this is a uh, something you guys do, Ian. Um, but I uh, I try to name all my proxy meshes with the uh, the prefix proxy. <laughs> Terry, I had to uh, I had to approve that message. Crazy Loch Ness. Thanks for joining us, pal. We'll see ya. Um, all right. Back to where I was. Uh, where the fuck was I? What was I gonna do? Yeah, I'm, I'm really big on naming conventions. That's why this bothers the hell out of me. These here, I don't know if you guys can read any of those. I fucking can't. It's on my screen. These are the names of the meshes that Megascans creates. T-G-N-G-D-I-B-F-A. It's like a fucking eye chart. I don't know why they would have named anything like that. This whole... It really it baffles me that, uh, that Epic partnered with these guys. It seems so half-assed the way it was put together uh i just don't i don't get it i don't get it i don't get it. anyway uh let's do let's do some high poly here uh in max in max in max okay i'm back in max we can rent this to an edible poly um it inherited the black color that came with it from uh, from Maya. One of the other things that's going to have come from Maya is I now have a custom attributes folder, um, which is current UV set channel one. Uh, so thanks for that, Maya. Uh, so what I'm going to do is make all of these meshes not white, so I can tell when things are selected or not selected. And I'm going to go and remove their materials so that they go back to their default gray here inside of Max. I'm also, because Maya tends to pooch my smoothing groups, I'm going to use a turn to poly and convert to edible poly uh, in order to try and reset the smoothing groups, which you can see it did. Got uh, all kinds of smoothing group issues here now. Uh, and then I've got to go and fix up my seams that were created for the UV island. So open borders. In fact, I'm going to do this within the edit poly modifier. This is one of the rare instances in which I like using the edit poly modifier. I have multiple meshes here. And if you use an edit poly modifier on multiple meshes, you can edit multiple meshes at once, which Maya just does this out of the, uh, out of the box, but uh, super useful to do this here. So I'm going to go and give this a couple of zeros in the decimal point and say, okay, and then go and double check where my seams are. And they should just be around the doors here and the handles and uh, not really anywhere else. So yeah, that fixes that. Uh, I can also use this opportunity to do my auto smoothing like so, though I'm going to have to take a really good look at what that did uh, just to make sure that it's not screwing anything up. Uh, for instance, this guy, we're going to clear all and put smoothing group number one on it. And then, whoops, in polygon mode, I'm just going to make the very back plate a different smoothing group. Uh, and the reason for that is that I've put chamfers on this stuff, um, which should allow it to look pretty decent on its own. And so that guy's good. Let's go check out this one. Oh, I'm still in the same model here. So let's go to polygon mode and edit geo. And we're going to say hide unselected. Just so we can take a look at what's happening here. Okay, I think that'll work. I don't really care much about the internal workings of it. Uh, this here should probably... What? I can't ring that? Max, I fucking hate you. So Max won't ring with the edit poly modifier. Oh. It won't ring edges either. Ring. Or at least my shortcuts don't fucking work. Is my button on? My button's on. Hehe. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, that should work. Okay, I'm pleased with this guy. Um, let's uh, this open, unhide all. I think everything else I'm going to live with. Again, I don't, I don't predict too many people staring intently at the furnace. Um, which should mean it, it should look just fine on its own. Uh, maybe these guys, this might be one place where I want to do this. Let's do this by angle and turn the angle down to maybe 10. I am going to separate the bolt front from the angle that's there. I think that's just going to read better. Okay. Convert this to an edible poly. I'm now going to go name everything. So uh, this is body underscore uh, low without any capitals, without any capitals back here. Low. This is the faceplate. Yeah, faceplate underscore low. Uh, let's attach the doors together, since there's no reason not to. These are going to be doors, underscore low. This is not an animated mesh, so I don't have to worry about anything like that. Uh, bolts low is fine. These guys we'll call hinges. Hinges, underscore low. Uh, what else? What else we got here? This guy. This is face bracket underscore low feet underscore low Let's hit H on the keyboard here to select from the scene. And see what I'm missing. So body low, bolts low, doors low, face bracket low, face plate low, feet low, hinges low, nut. So these should be nuts. Underscore low. And then object three. Ah, the frame. Lower door frame. We'll just call it door frame. Underscore low. Okay, so now that I have all of those things done, I'm going to re-export this again. Export selected, and I'm going to just overwrite the other furnace file that I had. And then we're going to go into our layers, and we're going to, I've got this all in the default layer here, so we're going to create a new layer uh, containing selected objects, which I'll call low. And then I'll select them all again, right click and clone. We're gonna make sure that these are all copies and I'll say okay. And I'll add them to their own layer, which I'll call high. We'll hide the low poly layer and then I can select all of the high poly objects, edit, uh, nope, tool, and I'm gonna to go to rename objects. And here we don't need a base name. I'm gonna remove the last six digits, the last six characters. And I'm going to add a new suffix of high. So when I hit rename, oh, it didn't work. I forgot to turn the suffix on. There we go. So there, that renamed all my high poly meshes for me. Um, this takes a little bit of the uh, the error out of the uh, out of the equation when it comes to naming things using the rename option because it just renames them based off the name that's there. So if I done made a typo somewhere, that typo is going to appear in the other mesh too, and I won't get any problems. Okay, now it's time to high poly this bad boy and see how this is going to work. So I'm going to start with a chamfer modifier. Then I'm going to use the unsmooth edges. I'm going to set this to be the quad chamfer. Oh, maybe we'll use the uniform chamfer. Yeah, that's better. There's the uniform chamfer. I am still getting a little bit of issue back here. I've got some little wonky edges that are going on. 
but they're at the back, and I'm going to see what happens when I get a turbo smooth on here with a couple of iterations. So, A, I'm not worried about the back because we're not going to see the back um, because it backs into a wall. In fact, I don't need any of those polygons, but I want to make sure everything else reads correctly. And this does look fairly decent. I'm getting really nice slopes on everything. Okay, so I'm pleased with that. I'm going to delete the Turbo Smooth modifier, and I'll bring back everything else. And what I'm going to do now is hold Control, and I'm going to drag my Chamfer modifier off of the stack onto another model, like the front boilerplate faceplate thing here. And then I'll add a Turbo Smooth with three iterations again and see what this thing looks like. Now, in doing that, in you can see that that Chamfer modifier is in italics. That means that it's an instance. That means that this is the same chamfer that's on the other mesh. And the reason that that's good is that if I select all my meshes, I can delete chamfer and they all disappear. So that's super useful. What I gotta do now is just go clean up my smoothing groups until they behave the way that they're supposed to. So if I run around the shape of this thing, like so, clear all, let's hit auto smooth. We can go back here. I know that in the uh, chamfer, I'm going to need this uh, minimum angle to be off. <laughs> Did you not know that? That was like one of the first things I learned about 3DS Max. If you hold control, you can pull a chamfer off of something onto something else. Uh, and that allows it, it makes an instance of it, right? So it's an italics, which means it's the same modifier. I didn't do that with Turbo Smooth. You can see it's that it's, it's a unique one here. But uh, yeah, no, you can absolutely do that. It makes it so much easier. In this instance here, you can see though that the, the chamfer that I've got is too wide for this mesh. So I can right click on it and I can make it unique, getting rid of the italic. And now I can go into the amount and I can pull the amount down like so. And now this mesh is going to work a little bit better. Wow. None of you guys knew that. Who the hell's been teaching you 3D? Oh. Yeah, I know it's super, super helpful to do it this way. Uh, let's see. Clear all 11. And I'm going to do the same thing around here. Go down here. Clear all 6. See how that works. Much cleaner. Uh, I think I'm going to put a chamfer down here too. Just in these three faces. Uh, auto smooth those to a different value. Uh, again, just so that that shape holds a little bit better. Rob! How you doing, brother? I didn't even know you were here, my friend. And lurking in the shadows. Let's clear this and put 15. Let's do this one. Uh, clear this, that one, and then these three. Okay, so that one should hold true. So I'm pleased with those. This one mostly looks good. Again, it's got a little bit of an issue with the front. So again, I can go in and... Actually, this one is already chamfered. So I think what I might do here is just make that one. Yeah, bud. Things are, uh, things are good, man. They're good. Thanks for asking. That's not what I wanted to grab. This one. This is what I wanted to grab. Remove this. 
I'm going to clear that and give this all 30. Because I think I've got enough chamfering built into the actual model modeling of this. Which I almost do. It's just right here. That it's falling apart. And I actually can see just a singular face there. So I'll go and give this whole thing its own. Topo gun. Turns out Topo gun likes to invert edges. Define invert edges. What do you mean invert edges? You mean like triangulation edges? Like the, the ones you can't see? Mm, I don't know what to do here. I need another edge in here. I need another edge on this side. And that's what I wanted to avoid. What happened on this side? Yeah, that's why triangulation is a thing. Um, it's why you want to avoid uh, being in, in, you know, being in as many software packages as you can is a good thing. Uh, because you will absolutely hit that point where, you know, it happens. And Max and Maya do this, right? They've got different uh, triangulation algorithms for how their topology works. As a character artist, I, I come across this all the time where I make a model and I'm really pleased with the way it looks. And then I give it to someone to rig inside of Maya. And I'm like, what the hell did you do to my model? And, uh, and it's because Maya just altered the triangulation, spun all the edges around. So we'll delete the turbo smooth and we're going to instance this modifier onto the doors. And I do believe the doors, let's go see what they look like here with the turbo smooth out of the gate. Not too bad. So I can see there's an issue here with stuff getting pinched underneath. Uh, and a little bit of an issue here too. I might need to strengthen an edge there. Uh, I don't think I want this crease to be as strong here. I think I actually want that to be pretty smooth. And then, yeah, there's all kinds of creasing going on up here. So it's going to take a little bit of cleanup to, to repair. Yeah, they're pretty old tools. It's not a, not a lot of people that still use them. Uh, okay. Uh, the correction for this... Uh, I've got a triangulated edge in there, five-point edge. So that's where the issue is coming from. Uh, so what I'm going to do is hopefully fix it by going around back, uh, which I'm not going to do that way. I'm going to do this way. And I'll try it with this one and see if it works. My topology might just not be set up to work here. Uh, so we're going to clear that and hit 32. Nope. Is off here and that's not going to fix anything just yet <laughs> okay so I need to run the edges up as well uh, which is like this needs to be its own clear all nine and then same thing here this without the back clear all 22 that should be getting close still pinching under Why is it pinching under chamfer is too big 
going to have to instance this chamfer or uh, make it unique and reduce the amount down even further here. I'm only at 0.14. There's not a lot of... Oh, and it actually went the wrong way. Okay, that makes it a little bit easier to see. I'm going to put it back to being instanced. And I can go back into my edit poly. So it looks like it actually didn't grab enough topology to make it smoothing. Uh, because I chamfered it. Okay. Well, I think... Good job, Terry. You had one job, Terry. One job. Okay, let's make sure these guys are all done correctly. That's all on one. I'm going to go to by angle, set it to 12, ignore back facing, and select the backs. And we're going to set all of that to one. And then I'm going to invert and set all of this to two. This isn't going to fix everything. I'm still going to get some wonky stuff in here. But it's going to get me closer. I'm getting that really nice molded cast iron look from this stuff. So what I need to do here now is start adding the edges back in that I'm missing. So, for instance, this guy here, uh, not, did I remove that? I did remove that. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to manually chamfer this. No, I don't want to manually chamfer it. That sounds stupid. Let's just go all the way around. All the way around. You, you, you. Let's auto group that. This is what's going to break the front here again. But it makes that shape hold. So we're going to. Mm, yeah, that looks all kinds of broken. Why are you broken? What? Why is this not ringing? Ring. Guns. Two. Two. Should not be two. Why is it not ringing again? This should have been one. Okay, that'll help that shape hold there. And then I'll do the same thing here. All the way around. Oh, that's why it's acting funny. God, I still have that on. Max for the win. Okay, that's three. So that door should hold up pretty nicely with the exception of the little uglies I've got on the corners here. And the fix for that is going to be to chamfer that edge. Oh, wait, that edge should be chamfered in here. It is. So let's switch this from uniform to quad. Get back out of here. Chamfer. Quad. Tension should be 0.5. Turbo smooth. Better. Okay. One of the doors. So I can do the same thing here. And just putting this all on another smoothing group. And with the chamfer settings already set up, what is, I got a hole in my model. I don't suppose that's a good thing. behind one of the hinges in the door, so I'm 
not going to give a shit. And on three. That one looks fine. I don't know why this is creasing here. Um, because I have too many edges. I'm going to manipulate my corners here. I have an edge here that uh, shouldn't exist. And so it's, it's causing there to be a large uh, area of pinch there. So I'm going to remove it. And we'll see how it does with the N-Gons, because on occasion that works. Not this occasion. But on some occasions, I'm told. And what I'll do is I'll use the Cut Tool and just run my way down here. That's cool. For whatever reason, those are the only vertices on my model. This is Max shitting the bed again. I don't know why it's done this. Uh, I'm going to bring this here. And here. And here. Here. I'm just trying to keep it to the center of these polygons. Oh, and then I fucking missed. Blast you. Blast. Blast. All right. Let's see what I did here. It looks like there's an extra vert. Extrovert. Not an introvert. There we go. All right. Hang on. It looks better. Uh, I'm going to say forget about doing this one uh, because I'm going to mirror this guy over, which will uh, hopefully do that. Other door automatically for me. And then I just have to do this one. And so again, we'll do this. I don't have anything selected back here. Oh, that's weird. I'm trying to get selection lag in max, which is... Ah, damn it. Not you. Oh, ignore back facing this on. Okay, so those guys hold up. Uh, and then I've got the same close edge error in here that we can go and manipulate this. I've got the same one down here. So, Christian, you were uh, talking the other day about. Uh, let's go behind. Long skinny triangles, and uh, this is those very, very thin polygons uh, are part of that same problem that you want to avoid. If you can. Because they'll, uh, they'll mess with your day. Bring this down in the middle here. Right. Lovely, 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 lovely. Doors look pretty decent. Uh, I need to uh, mirror this door over. So to do that, I'm first going to select it, delete it, select this one, detach it as a clone element, not element, just as a clone. And then I'm going to select and deselect, and I should now have the duplicate. And I'm going to run a mirror on the duplicate to put it. That's not right. Effect pivot only. My pivot's in the middle. Why did the mirror not do what it was supposed to do? Here, there we go. Very bizarre. Then I'll grab this one again. Go down here, punch this one, and voila, or finish door. Uh, I don't know. No, 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 that wouldn't have screwed up the UVs, the really small triangles. The UVs got screwed up because of uh, 
what Maya calls non-manifold geometry, which is uh, its its version of geometry that shouldn't exist, something that couldn't be three D printed. Um, when you do that in Maya, Maya has a hissy fit and just stops working altogether. Just doesn't want to do anything anymore. Okay, so uh, I want to put some writing on the front of this, and uh, this would have been better thought out uh, if I had preserved the rotation from this door, uh, which I didn't do. Uh, I kind of, I kind of did. Um, you know, I turned off my rotation snaps when I opened the door because I didn't want it to be five degrees or something. You kind of, you can kind of pick up on that when things are are perfectly snapped rotation wise. So I just wanted it very arbitrary. And in doing that, it's made it a little bit more difficult for me to put any kind of uh, writing on the front of this door. Oh, it looks like I've got a pinch on this one too. I'm gonna have to fix this one. Oh yeah, totally. So let's grab that edge. Let's zoom in on here. I'm in orthographic view. Yeah, that edge got way too small. Make sure there's nothing in the back selected. And I'll remove that. Now, I don't actually have anywhere for this edge to go. So I'm going to try and end on it uh, out. And what I mean by that is I'm going to take this edge to somewhere where it's flat, like here. And hope that that end gone works correctly. So if I go in, turn this edge off, and go in here, what I should be getting out of that end gone because it's planar is no effect on the geometry. And so that allows that shape to work a little bit better. You can see I'm still getting the pinch here, and that's because the end gone is on a curve. And so again, cut, come out a little bit, and up to a flat spot. And that should, without issue, give me a clean face. Okay, so back here again. And uh, I want to put some writing on the door. Um, uh, I don't know, a furnace. Uh, coal furnace door. Let's go look at some coal furnace doors and see what's written on them. They all have writing on them here, and I could probably do this just as easily in uh, Substance Painter. Provided. Yeah, I think I'm going to put it off to Substance Painter. Provided the UVs on this are straight enough, I'll, I should be able to do it there. So let's pop out of here, and we've got the doors done. I'm going to delete the Turbo Smooth on them. Uh, we'll drag that chamfer onto the handles and the Turbo Smooth. Give three iterations and inspect. This one should be good to go on its own. Yeah, no editing required. Lovely. I like when there's no editing required. We'll drag the chamfer onto the nuts. Ah, nuts. Why did it always have to be nuts? Put three iterations on here, and I think those look dandy. And the frame. We'll grab that chamfer again. Put it on the frame. Add turbo smooth. Give it a couple of iterations. Go and inspect. And that looks pretty clean. Delete the turbo smooth. There's this other frame here. Again, I'll just drag this onto that. Go and manipulate that. I can tell already where I'm going to want these polygons to be split. So that's these auto group. And these non auto group. I'll have to manually set these because the angle is not within tolerance. And then uh, we're going to go up here, deselect those, set those with intolerance. That should be that. Easy once you get a couple of these shapes under your belt, you start realizing where things should go. The other thing I'm going to do with this thing is that uh, I want to prevent bowing in this. 
So I'm gonna go in here and just add some connections. Maybe something like that. Just to prevent it from arcing up in the high poly, which is what its natural instinct is gonna to be to do. And so you can see it's still doing it a little bit here, how it arcs up before straightening out. But I think that's okay. Uh, let's put that same thing on the feet. Turbo smooth, couple of iterations, and in here, uh, I've definitely got some some workings. Let's isolate these. So this is just going to be the polygon mess at the bottom down here. Uh, essentially, this. I do that, and auto smooth. It should give me something a little bit better. But you do, and I'm happy. Okay, that should be all of the meshes. Um, and I wanna make sure that one by one, everything has a chamfer on it. Yes, yes. Uh-huh. Yippers. Flag it. Yep. Hinges do not. So same deal. Grab this, hold control, throw it on the hinges, throw a turbo smooth on. Got a few iterations. Inspect it. Looks lovely. And then the last one, nuts, do have it. So good. Now I'm ready to export my high poly. Now this is one of the things I do with all my high polys. This is high poly done. I don't ever save a file with hundreds of thousands of polygons in it. It is so unnecessary. A, it makes really big files. And that's a problem for both filling up your hard drive, but also just more opportunity for them to crash. Right? If you're trying to load a long file and Max kind of hangs a little bit, um, or worse yet, you're trying to save a file and it hangs for a little bit. You know, it might corrupt your file. So I just save them like this. To make this high poly, I add my Turbo Smooth. I give it a few iterations. In this case, uh, four, which is higher than I tested it originally. That brings me up to nine million polys. And a very quick inspection of this. And it looks much the way I want it to look. Yay. We'll go and export it. Okay, so this is not going to go in this folder, but the OBJ folder, and it's going to be an OBJ. I usually do this because I clear out my OBJ folder. So this is furnace underscore high. And everything is good here because I'm using my ZBrush preset. And then this will take, take a moment for it to go through its thing. All right, almost done. I'll jump into Painter and we'll do some uh, some quick paint job on this. Okay, so I think this is the last of the meshes here. Let's go and crack open Painter. And we'll begin setting up this project. So indeed, done is done. I didn't get any rat nest errors or anything. And then I can just delete the Turbo Smooth from everything and save this file if I need to. I'm just going to leave it open. And we'll start a new project here. So, uh, new. We'll go select my mesh. Projects, uh, what did I call this? Cabin in the Woods. And FBX. My brain's starting to slow down. 
Uh, I'm going to set this to 2K. It's a fairly big mesh. And okie dokie. And there it is in Painter. Now, it is important to notice that that triangulation stuff that you found, Bray, um, those turned edges, those turned triangles that you see, remember that where those triangles come from is the software telling you where, um, where those triangles should be. And where they're determined to be in 3ds Max isn't the same as Maya, nor will it be the same in here. This software can turn... Um, you notice the massive resolution of my screen. Oh yeah, you can barely read my interface. So I'm gonna yeah, I'm on a uh, what is this? 26 inch 4K. Um, and so yeah, this thing is massive uh, for me. Uh, I think the stream's only in 1080p, so uh, you probably won't be able to read shit in the interface here. Um, but uh, but yeah, I have to do it this way. If the interface is its regular um, ratio to scale, I can't I can't use the software. Okay, so uh, let's do some baking here. So uh, first things first, uh, bake meshes. I'm going to increase this to match my 2K. I'll bring the width of the dilation up to 16 and import the high poly mesh. So this again is in the OBJB and Fern K typo, uh, furnace high. We're going to make sure that anti-aliasing is turned on and that bake by mesh name is turned on. Uh, we're going to go down to ID and make sure that we're doing this by mesh ID. Ambient occlusion is going to get ramped up and we are going to make sure that self-occlusion is only the same mesh. Thickness, crank it up and that the self-occlusion is only the same mesh. And then we hit bake and we see what kind of results we get. Now, uh, typically when I'm doing an asset for the first time, I won't, I won't go do full res bakes like this at 2K. Um, however, I'm fairly confident in this model. Uh, it's, it, it hasn't got a lot of very interesting shapes on it that uh, things can go wrong. And so I'm predicting, shy of a horrible naming convention error, that uh, it'll actually just do exactly what I want it to do, uh, which seems to be the case here so far. So here comes the ambient occlusion. Uh, now, Bray, we've talked about this in the past, that the ambient occlusion here in Substance Painter is not ideal. Um, however, it is the ambient occlusion that I'm going to use. Uh, a mesh like this at a 2K bake uh, would probably take 3ds Max uh, an hour to bake, if not more. And uh, I ain't got that kind of time. I'm, I'm sick of this mesh already, and so... We'll, uh, we'll get rid of that, um, that waiting period, that time period. Um, and voila, my bigs are done. So we'll go have a cursory, cursory inspection here of how things turned out. So it looks like the um, the stream might have crapped out a little bit. Um, you guys can still see me, yeah? We're still live here. Uh, Substance Painter doesn't bake a true ambient occlusion. Um, I did this the other day for Bray when I was doing Gator. I think it was Gator that I was working on. The ambient occlusion that it does in here is it's it's kind of close enough to be ambient occlusion. And, and what they do is they, they actually cheat it a little bit to make it bake faster. But uh, uh, the issue has to do with the uh, <clears throat> the emblems I put on the car. So where the gator badge is on the Jeep. That is one material on a mesh that's on another mesh that has a different material. And the, uh, the problem was that if you have self-occlusion on only, then the chrome badge won't cast a shadow on the paint job. 
but if you turn on ambient occlusion for everything, you end up getting weird artifacts and it isn't actually correct. And so uh, I usually will bake things like that. This is just one solid mesh. I only have one material ID on this. And so it's not going to give me any errors, but uh, that would definitely be something I'd think about in... Uh, Oh, there's, there is one error on here, and I don't know if it's worth me rebaking. I'm missing one crease right here. And I don't know how much that's going to piss me off. Let me see how noticeable it is. That's really fucking noticeable. I'm going to say, let me see how noticeable it is once I get the... Uh, let's go back into Max. Yeah. It's on this mesh... This row of polygons should have had a different ID. And that requires a re-export because I need those creases to line up. All right, so I'll export this again. Export selected. And you might get a, uh, a drop in video quality here as I do this. Um, not the export, but the bake again. Um, my system pulls all resources from the CPU when I do a bake. And so it... Uh, it's one of those things that you might get... You might get some crappy uh, video output here for a moment. So I'm going to go back into my bake settings and we're going to delete the high poly that's here. And we'll wait for Max to finish its output. And I'll load it back in again. Uh, Im important note, Substance Painter does not auto-update meshes. So if I just overwrite this over the original mesh, it won't automatically know that there's a new mesh and bring it back in. Um, and so you have to remove the mesh and then load the mesh back in manually. But yeah, the AO issue is uh, multiple, multiple material IDs um, with models that are against each other. You don't get accurate shading. You don't get any kind of uh, occlusion from one mesh onto another. Okay, so now I can add high and poly back in and bake again and really that's that line right there that's the only thing that i was missing so we'll let this bake it's going to take a moment here to get started again because it's going to import that high poly again however as soon as that's in there we go it'll start baking and we should see that nice clean edge there that i was missing It's pretty minor, and it's uh, on the sides of this thing that are going to be against the wall, but um, it's going to bother me knowing that it's there. Okay, just the thickness now. There we have it. Looks nice and clean. Yeah, I'm pretty pleased with that. And I'm going to go save this. Actually, that's a lie. I'm not going to save it. Let's tempt the gods. Let's not save. So I wanted to see how well this would work. This is just the uh, the default rust. And uh, I thought I would give it a whirl here. And uh, man, that is pretty close to what I wanted done with this. Um, so I'm going to open up some, some old coal furnaces here. Coal furnace and uh and look at some 
look at some old versions of these things here. Go put uh, old coal furnace in here. Maybe even abandoned. There's that's the one that I really like. So this is the one that uh, was the basis for most of my modeling. Um, was just mimicking kind of some of the shapes and things that are in this. Uh, I simplified it quite a bit with the chute that's at the bottom. Uh, I didn't really want to go and put that level of detail in here. Uh, and I didn't want to put the slots in here too, because originally I wasn't going to do any of the interior until I decided to open the door. Uh, but anyway, this was the thing that I decided the model. So you can see where the spouts are on top. I moved mine down to the side here, and then I've got the side spout as well. So I'm going to have to build all of this piping um, stuff as well. I'm not overly concerned about that. Uh, but in terms of the look of this thing, like it's it's pretty much cast iron, rusty cast iron. Right? There's really not a lot going on with this. Um, now the the mesh that I've got here at the moment, like this is really, 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 really past that. Um, let's see what the rust course looks like. Oh, that's overkill. I'm also really at the limits of a 2K texture and what it can do here. Um, we're really not getting a lot out of this, uh, out of the noise and stuff here. We're starting to get pixelization in this. And so this is about as big a mesh as I can go, uh, doing this kind of thing. And so, yeah, I mean, this is lovely too, but, uh, I think I'm going to go it alone here and try and get something that matches, uh, a little bit closer to what I'm seeing there. So we'll start blue and shiny, which... Mm, might stand out in the basement a little bit. So let's go and first grab some color here. So I'm gonna go into a, a brownish hue, something like that. And then uh, I'm gonna put some roughness to this. I'm using the, the reference image here to try and capture the same type of highlights on this that I see on that. A little much. Okay. That's better. I want to put a little bit of a grain on this too. Again, it's kind of, it looks like chocolate right now. It's really, really smooth. Um, so I'm going to add a, uh, a height channel here. And inside of the height channel, we're going to go and look up some noise. And we'll just, typing for the win. We'll just go and grab some noise to put on here. And I want to be kind of careful what kind of noise I put in. Um, that I want it to be... Uh, it might work. I want it to be very, very minute in what it is. So this is obviously not that. Uh, I'm going to add a levels to this. And in the levels, we'll adjust the height. And I'll bring the levels back to where they should be. And then I'm going to go in here, and we'll adjust the height. And I'll pull this down quite a bit smaller. So I'm at 3. And even at 1 or 2, it's going to be a little too much. I'm going to go into this scale here, and we're going to shrink it down a little bit. I want to get kind of just to the point that we start see the, seeing the repetition. And I'm going to rotate it a little bit. That's going to help with the repetition. Okay, something like that. It's it's still a little large, and I'm only at 2% here. In fact, if I bring this down to 1, again, we're going to get still something that's probably stronger than I want it to be. Oh, you know what? That's not too bad. Okay, yeah, we'll leave it like that for now. Uh, I want to put all kinds of dirt and grunge and grime on this. Uh, again, to make it feel uh, very much part of that basement. Um, to make it feel lived in and whatnot. Um, I don't want to put any metallic value on this because it's all meant to be rust. I think I might take the um, the roughness here and bring it up a little bit more. Like so. Um couldn't hurt me to play around with the base color here a little bit too. Uh, so I'm going to switch this back to base color. I'm going to add another fill layer that is just going to be color. 
And in here, I'm going to do a search for grunge. Uh, if I can spell. And we'll go and find an appropriate grunge for this thing. I'm going to make sure that this is also a triplanar. Not too bad. Where's my scale? Again, I want to try and get to the point that I don't see repetition on this. This is one that I don't want to rotate, though, because uh, these start to look like streaks on here. So I'm going to set this instead of a normal to be an overlay. And then we'll pull the opacity down. Something a little bit more like that. Which is not too bad. No, this is, it's not going to be a up and running uh, furnace. I don't want to have any, anything glowing in here. Um, and so, yeah, there's not going to be any need for that. Although that would partially fix my, my lighting issue if I had done that. Uh, but yeah, that was never the, uh, the intended plan. Uh, okay, I'm going to grab some fine rust and put this above. And in the fine rust, let's tweak the scale here. Okay, it actually looks best here. Uh, I'm going to add a black mask to this, a generator to the black mask, and in the generator, we're going to go and add the dripping rust to this. It's not too bad on its own. Yeah, it's not too bad like that. I'm going to play around with the, the amount of rust I'm getting here. Turn the dripping up a little bit more. That'll give me some really nice stuff like under these bolts here. Now, I need to make sure that I'm using the... Um, the 3D projection for this as well, because I have UV seams in uh, in pretty obvious places on this that are going to become very apparent if I'm not careful here. There's a good example right there. So we're going to go to the rust and make sure that this is triplanar projected. We're going to go into the grunge or the map that I did. Uh, uh, this dripping rust... Doesn't look like I'm going to get the ability to do that here. I might just end up with a little bit of a seam there. It's not too bad. Okay, so we've got some rust on it. I'm going to go and put some caked on dirt. So again, I'll start with my magic blue. And let's go do a nice, rich brown. That's going to be pretty... Darkness, even a little bit more. This is going to be pretty rough in terms of the uh, how how reflective this is. And uh, let's go name this Dirte. And uh, let's see what else do we want to do here with the dust, uh, the dirt. Let's go and add a black mask, add a generator. The generator. Let's go and add the dirt. And that's getting there. Let's make sure that dirt is doing what we want it to do. Where is my use triplanar on? A little bit better. Grunge mount just right. Just custom grunge on, custom grunge. Grunge. Try this guy. Ooh, Ooh I like it. I like it, I like it, I like it. Uh, grunge scale. Let's watch that. Do I have a contrast? I do. Oh, that's triplanar contrast. Not what I want. It's the dirt contrast that I want. Now, I'm going to turn off the custom. 
Use custom grunge. No. Because I like the way it looked a little bit better this way. Uh, okay, as I uh, mentioned, I wanted to put something on the door. And so uh, let's maybe I'll put my, my Turner Made logo on here. Um, so I'm going to add a new paint job, which I'll bring down to the bottom. And we're going to go into uh, alphas. And in the alphas, we'll go grab a text node. Let's see what we got here. So, well, that's a, that's a pretty funky one. I like that. Okay. Make this nice and big. Uh, and then in here, turn it made. Uh, there is my Oh, it's not the scale. It's the scale of size. That's what it is. And make this bigger and then make that bigger. Okay, so I can do that. And then what I'm going to be painting here is height. And I want to paint the height nice and high. And we'll go and stamp that on there. Turn it made. There we go. Um, let's see what's on the other doors here at the bottom. Uh, there's some kind of like made in some kind of date type thing in here. Which uh, is probably not a not a bad idea. Put a date on. Uh, let's do this date. That means over six. We'll place this right about here. Okay. We're gonna go into brushes, and I'm just gonna reset my brush back. Without none of that nonsense. We'll go into height, and we're gonna use the height slider to get those to look a little bit more natural that uh the other thing that i want to do is i'm going to add an anchor point here and the anchor point i'm going to call it uh, additional height now the anchor point is four um none of what uh, is happening here with dust or grime or dirt is interacting with what i've just painted on this layer um my additional height layer and uh, and that's because it's once just stamped in, whereas everything else is all part of the normal map or whatnot. And uh, what you can do with an anchor is you can actually make anything that you've painted in this layer uh, appear just like it was part of the normal map. And so to do that, if I go into some of these areas here that are doing some of these other things, so for instance, uh, I can go into this map here, Rust Fine, uh, dripping rust doesn't appear to have the input I need and dirt, uh, dirt does. So here's micro height. I'm going to click on that. And instead of loading a micro height, I'm going to go to the anchor points and pick my own anchor. I'm going to tell it that the rare, the layer it's looking at is the height layer. Like so. And then I'm going to go tell it in the micro details to use my micro height. And when I do that, I'm now going to get dirt appear around this thing like it was part of the, uh, like it was part of the actual bake. And so this means that I probably want to play around with just how strong I'm making the dirt here. That's a little bit of overkill uh, on that, but that's okay. I can go and add a paint here and we're going to paint in black and I'm going to go and grab what's that. No, no. That one I like. Grab this dirt brush here. And I'm going to be painting in black, so it's going to be undoing the mask a little bit. And all I want to do is just kind of go around this a little bit to soften it somewhat, because it was really, really, really strong. So I'm just kind of go around the perimeter a little bit to tone it back. It's just not quite strong. Same thing here. Let's just pull this back a little bit. Still want some of the dirt there, but it just doesn't have to be that powerful. There. 
that makes it stand out a little bit better and uh, looks a little bit better okay uh let's see what else could we put on this thing um this is the problem i'm looking at the reference <laughs> And these things are only ever just like rusted metal. Like there's nothing else going on with these things other than this like this cast iron with a sheet of rust on it. Which is kind of where I am already. So I think what I'll do is I'll maybe just put some splotches on it. Um, maybe places where it had been uh, wet and then dried a little bit, uh, which I think might work. So here's here's an instance of that broken normal map. Uh, that broken ambient occlusion map, rather. You see these two pieces right here? There is zero ambient occlusion between those two meshes. And there should be, right? We should actually see AO right in there. But we're not actually getting any AO in that area. And uh, that's unfortunate. And that's where 3ds Max's AO bake would probably fix that. So let's let's try an AO Bacon Max. I don't know I said I wouldn't. But uh in times like this. So in this instance, I am gonna save this because in order to bake my AO properly, I've gotta merge this object down. So I'm gonna go to Cabin in the Woods and Max. And this is just gonna be my furnace. Photo Nas. Like so. And now that it's saved, I'll attach it all together. So attach everything. So and render to texture. Before we can render to texture, I need a light. Otherwise, I'm not going to get any shadows. So we'll use a skylight with shadows on uh, abort creation. Like so. We're going to kill the padding and I don't need to project channels one add a shadows map okay go save where this is gonna go Let's go to projects and uh, this is cabin in the woods throw it in textures for now actually I don't want it in the textures I'm gonna throw it in the OBJ my placeholder Save that. I only need 24 bits. Uh, background color should be white. Almost missed that. And render. And render. What's happening? You. I have to enable it. Render. Don't display. Just render. So we'll see how, how quick here my new machine can do this. I'm hoping it's not going to be too long. I have in the past been trying to sp speed this up a little bit. Uh, rendered ambient occlusion maps at 1024 and just scaled them up. Or just left them at 1024 uh, since they're being used as an additional map. But the uh, the new PC here is not too bad in baking this. I also didn't, didn't crank up any settings. Because um, I don't really care too much about this mesh. So I'm not using... I'm not using a... Uh, I'm not using any kind of uh, super sampler or pixel correction or any ali aliasing or any of that stuff. I'm just kind of one-to-one -one baking this out. So we'll see. We'll see how this works. But yeah, this should give me the uh, the missing ambient occlusion. It's not there. And I'll uh, I'll show you the before and after. Ian, if you're still here, I'll show you what the before and after is of doing AO and Max and how big of a difference it is. This is one of those things that when Substance Be Painter became uh, kind of standardized, when it became the thing that everybody started using, not everybody noticed that the ambient occlusion was broken. Or that they're they're doing something else with the ambient occlusion that isn't isn't really truly ambient occlusion. 
and um and not everybody noticed that and so this has become a thing that when i'm i'm looking at stuff on art station i can tell you exactly who used art station or art station who used a uh, substance painters default bake and who who did something else um because it becomes really really apparent right you can you can see those missing areas when you know what you're looking for um when you when you know that there's two meshes against each other and there should be shadowing and uh and there isn't in in there but there is beautiful shadowing everywhere else you uh you kind of pick up on that stuff a little bit and so i know i definitely see it in a lot of my student work um when the uh Yumi Next contest ended this year. Um, a lot of students had me review their stuff, and it was it was very obvious on a lot of them. It was like, oh yeah, you did this in Substance Painter, you did this in Substance Painter. Um, the I mean, occlusion is is near correct, but not not enough. It's not perfect, and that even changes too. Like when you get these things inside of in the engine. You know, you put it up against a wall and you've got this baked ambient occlusion on your mesh. Well, that, that wall would be casting a shadow on an object. And so unless you're getting, you know, from your baked lighting, that shadow being added to it, you know, you're going to get some incorrect ambient occlusion in other places too. And so not everything can be done that way. I mean, obviously, if you're set dressing an environment, um, you know, you want to be able to pick and choose where you put things and not bound by where shadows are. Um my environment here is a little bit different than that in that, you know, this furnace is going to exist in one place and I'm picking where that one place is. Um, so technically, I could have baked this ambient occlusion map with the ground plane in place, which would again change the ambient occlusion. Um, and then with the, the walls around it too, that would change the AAO as well. But I don't think that's necessary. Not at this point. We're almost done, yeah? Oh, Christian, you posted a, uh, a gun. What is that, a Glock? Okay, almost done. One little tiny sh middle bit here. And voila, done. Okay, so let me show you the difference here inside of Substance Painter with the, uh, let me go to my textures here. So I'm not going to overwrite the old ambient occlusion that's there, which looks like this. I'm just going to bring in the new one. And I'll show you the difference between them, kind of this before and after, if you will. So I'll bring this new one in. This is going to be a texture for the current session only. So if you look at it, here's the, the Substance Painter baked one. So you can see it's a lot of grayscale and, uh, and whites. And here's the one from 3ds Max, which has got a lot of blacks and grays. And so if I head over to my baked maps here and we sub these things out so again the the area of real big importance here is going to be around this plate and even the body on the legs you can see the body's not actually casting any kind of shadow onto the legs onto the feet so i'm going to sub this out uh that's thickness here and you can see that drastically changes how much aiming occlusion we're getting on this thing now this blew out my dirt map and so i'm going to go into the dirt here and i can pull it back a little bit more i'm going to add more grunge and pull the amount down and add a little bit more grunge that's a little bit better so i'm now actually getting that dust and dirt kind of in and around here where it should be and again i'm getting you know the effect of the feet um being manipulated by the rest of the body so it uh it definitely has a very strong effect on this um when you see them side by side
Yep, it's a really big difference. And again, not it's, it's one of those things that not enough people pay attention to what's going on in Substance Painter to realize that it's not doing a true bake. It's not actually doing what you think it's doing. And they're like, oh my god, it is so incredibly fast at baking. And I was like, well, of course it is. It's not actually baking what you think it's baking. Okay, so let me go put some splotchies on here. Uh, maybe wet spots that have kind of dried on it a little bit. Um, let's do this with another fill layer. Uh, I don't know that I'm going to put color on this. Uh, yeah, I'll probably put some color on this. So I'm going to do color and I'm going to do some roughness. Um, so let's do... Let's do maybe something in a dark matted green and I want it to be matte maybe about there I want it to be a little bit more reflective than the dirt and uh, I don't need any normal or metallic or height to this I just need the color and the uh, the rough and uh, let's go and toss in um, a black mask and then on the black mask, we're going to add a generator. And then we're going to go to the generator here. And let's find, uh, let's see, what will work nicely here. Uh, dripping rust. Now, the problem with the dripping rust is that it's what I'm using already on the, uh, on the, on the rust. So we're not going to use dripping rust. Let's go back in here. Distance, ambient, or new fiberglass edgeware, metal edgeware. None of these things are really what I want. So let's go instead into our smart masks. See if I get anything here that's going to look like splotchy here's one called water drips let's see what that does so mask builder try planer on it's not too bad it's just giving me a couple of these like little splotchy areas here it's really really subtle let's try Try another one here. Here's dirt splashes. And dirt spots. Let's try dirt splashes first. Okay, that's a little bit more as to what I was looking for. And what I'm going to do with this now is just really make it subtle. So I'm going to go into the color. And just get it to the point where it's barely noticeable and uh actually you know what i might do go back into this layer let's pull the rust the uh the splotches the other way i'm gonna make them a little shiny and i'm gonna move this layer below the dirt and this is just gonna give me some little tidbits of light reflected off this object, which I think is going to help it work a little bit better. Okay. I'm going to call that done if freaking enough. Uh, let's go and export our textures here. So the first thing I want to do is go pick and choose where I'm going to put these things. Have it in the woods. Textures. I need a new folder. Or do I have furnace in here already? No footer nests. Okay, furnace, furnace, and then in here is where we're going to put things. This is going to be the UE4 packed. PNG is fine. Texture set is fine. That's fine. That's export. And into Unreal we go. So, step number one is just going to be to re-import this guy. Let's head over to his folder and re-import. Since I've been overwriting that mesh... We should actually just see clean UVs appear on this thing, which is good. Next, I'm going to go to my textures and materials, and I don't have a furnace folder here, so we'll go and make one. 
Urnas. 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 Furnas. There we go. Van Furnas. And I will go and import my three textures, which are going to be in Cabin in the Woods. Textures. Furnas. Uno, dos, tres. And then we'll go and generate a material from this. We'll call this Furnace. Or Furnk. Good, good job, Unreal. Auto save with the most inopportune time. Furnace. Okay. Grab. This should be no sRGB. I'll bring these two in. And we'll set them up. Uh, this one is the normal AO rough. I, don't, I, I hear the fawns every time I plug that map in. AO! Okay. That looks good. Well done. Close that. And uh, we should now be able to plug this on here. So I'm going to grab that material. Uh, let me go into my meshes again here and open them up. I want to apply it in the uh, content browser and not just in the world. So furnace, and there it is there. Select this material and then tell it to get used. Whoop. There's one furnace in Unreal. And there's the furnace now in the world. If you select it, let's do a uh, do a light bake here to see what it looks like. I'm getting a lot of reflected light from the back, which again I think is bleed through from my walls not being closed off, and so uh, I'll have to close them off, or as Ian suggested, um, go and throw in some kind of a uh, BSP blocking volume in behind. So that it reads correctly. Ooh. Man, does that barely ever even get registered. Let's uh let's see it in game here. I'm gonna wander around. That's kinda what I wanted. Takes up a good chunk of the room and and it looks the way I wanted it to look. Not too bad, not too bad. Um, yeah, I think I'm pleased with everything else that's going on here. I played around with some scaling stuff here. So all my, uh, all my little meshes now are nice and big. In the viewport which is good my old coin reads really nicely and whatnot bray are you still here uh i have a i have a skylight and it's movable right now and so it is uh it is contributing to the light that's that's what i call this project shiny mannequin butt cheeks well wow, that's that's not butt cheeks there we go Meh. i can't even make it do that um yeah so i do have a uh i do have a skylight in the world it's not technically doing what i wanted to do just yet um so a lot again part of losing the furnace into the room here this is associated to just how dark um oh you don't Terry you don't know what this is so remember the um the roulette wheel the roulette thing that you played when you guys picked your characters this is this is two versions of that forward <laughs> so i've kind of made changes to it every year um and this is the most recent uh, version of that and uh, what we're going to be doing this year is uh, is creatures monsters uh, killers 
And the, the way that this works is that students are going to, when they play, they're going to spawn somewhere random in the basement. And they're not going to be given any instruction. And so they have to kind of just wander around. And the, the basement's going to be filled with stuff. It's going to be very cluttered. Um, provided I can model enough stuff to make it cluttered. Um, but more like kind of like what you see over here, like with just stuff everywhere. And what's going to happen is every now and then while they're walking around kind of exploring, they're going to come across parts of the world that when they get near them get highlighted like this. And when an object gets um, highlighted and they click on it, you get a little description of what this object is. So it looks like an old movie prop. Well, it has to be. No one would wear this in real life. I guess maybe you could wear it for Halloween. And each one of the prompts relates to a different kind of monster or creature or uh, scary thing. And you can either put the item back or you can take the item. And when you take the item, you commit to this being the creature that you're doing. And so everything's kind of there in disguise. And so, for instance, uh, this one here, the old cap, which has a Wayne's World logo on it. This is Michael Myers from the Halloween franchise. Mike Myers being the actor from Wayne's World and Halloween being prominently mentioned here. And so if a student isn't kind of fully aware of that, they wouldn't know that this is... This is... Uh, uh, they wouldn't be fully aware that that's Mike Myers. And so each one of these things, like the balloon, um, you know, now you're working on a killer clown. And if you go over to the ram skull, oh, that's in the wrong place. The ram skull uh, would get you to be doing working on a demon. And over here is a bit of garlic. And if you click on the garlic, then you're working on a um, and you're working on a vampire. And so there's kind of like little things. Oh, what is what is that? Oh, it was the beam. I guess I gotta kind of be careful where I put the camera. Uh, and so the pumpkin. Then you're gonna be doing a uh, jack o' lantern creature or whatnot. And so anyway, there's gonna be uh, fifty of these items, five zero, all strewn across the world here. And whatever they come across is kind of what they're gonna be working on. And so here's my there's my alien pod that's kind of pulsating and gross. And so, yeah. <laughs> that gets me every fucking time. That, uh, that laugh is my daughter. Um, she wanted to be a part of this, and so we recorded her laughing. And there are places, random places in the world, that when you happen across them, you hear her laugh, or you hear this. And so anyway, yeah. The other thing that I did, the other reason that I, I kind of kept improving on this is that there were there were constant problems with the other ones that I did. So, Terry, for instance, yours, when you guys did it, um, it was two maps that were in Unreal, right? The male and the female one. And I had to, like, open one up and close the other one and then do the girls first or the guys first or whatever. And that was, that was very problematic. And so um, I kind of changed that so that it was all-inclusive. And the one that I did after that... Everybody's was all together. And then uh, the problem with the second one was that I had to keep writing everything down. So every time somebody filled in, uh, every every time somebody used the game, um, I had to open up my notepad and write down what their name was and what they got so I could keep track of everything. And uh, this system is going to, is going to um, fix that problem. So the actual main... Um, main level the main opening that you're going to see is more this there's going to be a title screen over the top 3d sculpting organic modeling and it's going to ask you for your name so you can go and click here and type in your name and then there's an email address and you're going to want to go type in your email address so me at george brown and it isn't until you filled in all the information that the begin button happens and when you click that that's when you spawn in the world now the other thing that's going to happen is that once you've picked up one of these objects um, see a ram skull here. Once you've picked this up, when you click take, the game is actually going to email both me and the student. 
and give them uh, give a description of what they got. So it'll say the Ram Skull. This student is doing the demon. And so that way the student will get a record of what they're doing and I'll get a record of what all the students are doing and it'll all be in my email and I won't have to do anything. And so it's all automated, which is uh, which is the, the fun part of this. Uh, what is this now? Pick up mesh. Uh, there's a collision problem with one of my meshes. And so anyway, yeah, that's what this is. This is... Uh, it's an upgrade from the one that was in your class. And I kind of keep making, I keep evolving the system. Um, okay, so let me go check out my lighting here and see what I can do with the skylight. I'm going to try and bump up the uh, intensity um, and see if I can't get a little bit more, a um, little bit more out of this. I'm sure that skylight's actually doing something too. It's not doing all that. Uh, a good chunk of this is mine. There are two systems that uh, I'm using that I purchased from the marketplace, um, but they were they were in incompatible with what I wanted to do. They weren't complete, and so I've made a, a lot of major modifications to them. Uh, one of them that I bought was the object interaction um, with picking things up and putting them back down. I bought that system, but it was uh, it was pretty clunky as it uh, as it exists on the marketplace. And so I made some changes to it, which include things like um, the way that the other the that it was designed to be used. Um, the person created a a new blueprint for every object in the world. Um, and I got away from that in having a list of objects. So all 50 objects that can be attained are in this blueprint. Um, and what that means is that I can go and manipulate any of the, here's another one of my blueprints. I can go and manipulate any one of these things by just changing the number. So from 33, I can go to two and now it's the balloon. I go to 33 and now it's the calendar again. And so I can actually go and swap all of these things out. Um, it does not prevent duplicates. So if one person got one, it doesn't change anything. Um, but because of this system, I'm not as concerned with that. This isn't like uh, like the Marvel game that I played at one point in time with Terry's class where, you know, I don't want seven people doing Spider-Man. Um, but here, you know, if you get a vampire and seven different people get a vampire, you're still going to end up with seven very different characters, right? Like these are... These are archetypes more than they are specific characters, and that makes it work with duplicates. And so that is uh, that is definitely one of the things that is, is going to improve on this over the other system. Yeah, it's essentially it's done in a series of, of blueprint systems. Most of them are in the uh, the character blueprint where you do a trace out from the character to all of the objects that are there um, in order to uh, to tell if that is an object you can pick up or not. Uh, and then it, you do a distance between the character and the object to make sure that you're close enough to it that you can pick it up. And so, yeah, anyway, I've been putting, uh, I've been putting a lot of work into it, um, trying to get it just right. The uh, unlike, unlike when I made the roulette one for you guys and the Overwatch one after you guys, um, the school's actually paying me to do this one. And so uh, it means that I'm putting a little bit more effort into it and, uh, you know, I'm trying to make it as, as dynamic and as cool looking as possible. And so, yeah, that's kind of kind of where it's at. Uh, I should make another folder. Put my blueprints in here. The world blueprint and all of my items can go inside there. That way I can minimize those. No, so that's that's gonna end the game, Christian. Um when you when you play and you uh and you click the pick up item, um that's it. It's gonna end the game. So there isn't there isn't an inventory. Someone can't go around collecting everything. Um when you play, that's kind of why I keep I keep not hitting that button. But if you pick something up, there's take and there's put back. 
So if you put if you put back, this item just goes back into the world. If you take it, this is what emails me and closes the game. And so, yeah, that's how it works. So yeah, it, it's in, it's built into the design that no one is going to be able to uh, to pick up more than one thing. No thanks, Terry. It's nice nice to hear that um, it is. It is something that people notice. Um, you know, and another reason I'm doing this too is that we're going to be working from home, right? It's uh, we're going to be doing another remote schooling in September, and so, you know, I've got to work a little harder to make sure that the the students are into what we're doing, um, because you'll lose them faster with uh, with working remotely, and so I want to make sure that um, that I've got my hooks into them and that they they're caring about what they're doing um, so that, you know, they work a little harder at it. So let's go see what we can do with this skylight here. So I'm using a, uh, a scene captured uh, environment here at the, at the, for the time being, um, which is fine. That'll, that'll work. Uh, I don't have any scene reflection capture actors in here, um, which I should probably put in. Uh, sphere reflection capture and uh, I should probably put a few of these guys in uh, in various locations this is probably easier to do from the top and uh, you can see the breadth of area that they're going to kind of cover and I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a couple of these in a kind of strategic places here maybe there and there and then one at the other end and uh, those are going to help with the uh, the reflections on things a little bit. Now, uh, one of the things that I I really wish I was I was going to be able to do it is to um, enable ray tracing on this. My video card supports ray tracing, and if I turn it on in this project, it looks absolutely uh, incredible. But I can't be uh, certain that every student is going to have a machine with ray tracing on, and so. I don't want the system to break because of a student's computer. Um, all right, let's see what else we can do here. Let's go look for in 10. That's not the right search here. Intensity. Intensity scale. Whoa. So, wow. That is one hell of a nuclear fucking pumpkin. That ramped up really quick. Let's try a two in here. So it seems to affect my... my placed meshes more than it does anything else in the world. Um, this is movable. There we go. That's what I wanted. Okay. Go back to intensity. And I'm going to plug these guys back. Just back down to one. So you can see what that skylight does uh, in here when the intensity is up too much. Um... Well, the um, it'll be the fact that it emails me. They can run or they can play the game as many times as they want, but I'm only going to accept the first email that comes in. So let's do another build here. We'll build the lighting only. Uh, as soon as you start playing around with any settings, you got to do another build. Um. And the more you play with lighting, the more it tends to start slowing down the build process. Um, but we'll see what this does. So this is this is definitely like in the middle of the day now. Um, and you can see how much magic is lost in this environment when you can see. Um, you know, it's it's you can see how sparse it is. And palette is floating. Um, you can see how just barren it is. And so... The idea is to get this down to a point where you are getting enough light to see around the environment and it's not blowing it out.
I, I will. Um, I am going to at some point. I don't even think I'm going to use the skylight, but uh, but we'll go and see. Um, one of the other things, too, is that if you use a specific cube map um, and you go and plug one of those things in here, you'll actually get much better lighting than this. But I don't want to do that until the world's done, uh, until I've, I've got most of the environment built, um, because that'll really change things, too. You can see how much the props blend into the environment now with the, um, the, uh, the lighting set to a far more manageable state. <laughs> um, so let me go in and, uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll ramp up the, uh, the light baking settings. Um, and I'll see... I'll see what I can find here. Me. Go and play around with my light map settings. So the first thing I'm going to do, let me just save everything here. And I'm going to close the engine. And this guy's done, so we'll close this. I realize I didn't save, but I'm happy with what I've got, so that's okay. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to open up the uh, the light mass I and I settings for my game, and uh, and this is going to help me uh, manipulate the things. So when you do a uh, when you do a light pass bake in Unreal and you choose your production quality uh, or um, you know, low, medium, or high, or production, when you choose that quality bar, what, what you're clicking on when you choose those things is just different light mass settings that come from within the engine. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of important to getting really, really solid lighting. So if I go into where Unreal is installed, uh, not that one. Program files, Epic Games, and I'm in 4.25. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and navigate to where the configuration files are. So that's engine and config. And the one that I'm interested in is called bait, base light mass I and I. So that's this guy right here. Now, because I'm not an idiot, I'm first going to go name this backup so that I can uh, I can go and make changes to it without screwing it up. And uh, we're going to then take it and copy and paste it in here. And now we're going to go and edit this one. So we're going to remove the copy and remove the back. So this is now my light mass I and I. And when you open this up, it's just a text document here. And this is a list of all of the settings for doing your uh, your light mass baking. So it, it has things like static shadowing, uh, importance tracing, photon mapping. It has all the settings for everything that you can do in here. And when you scroll down to the bottom, what you'll see here is the settings. So if you choose medium quality, Here's the settings that it uses. And if you use high quality, here's the settings. And if you use production quality, here's the settings. And so this is what I'm gonna go do is edit these. I'm gonna go make changes to this um, that are going to give me better results in terms of what the baking does. And so the idea here is to go and play around with the numbers that are here. Now, you got to be careful when you do this because some of the numbers need to go up and some of the numbers need to go down based on what it is that you're doing. And so that's what I'm going to do is go and change some of these. And so this is things like uh, number of indirect photons that you want to play with. Um, and that's a really good one. And the scale of the photons is really good too. The larger the photons are, the quicker the lighting bake um, however, the quicker the lighting bake means the less accurate it is. 
And so we're going to go and play around with some of these things in order to uh, give us a much better looking bake in the end. Okay, so let's go and play around with some of these numbers here. So let's see. Um, I'm going to take the number direct photon scale, um, which again is a good one to go and manipulate. I want, let's see, 8, 32, 6, 5, 8, 3. Yeah, number of direct photon scale. Let's crank this up to 100. I don't know why that didn't type. There we go. 100. Um, which is good like that. You can see there's some uh, there's some comments in here too. It will tell you what some of these things do. Uh, there's the number of indirect photon path scale, the number of indirect photon scale, number of indirect radions photon, and a lot of, a lot of stuff you can play with. Um, so that's the first one I'm going to change. The second one I'm going to change um, Let's see. Uh, it's the number of bounces that I want now. Uh, let's see. Uh, indirect photon scale. Indirect photon scale 8. I think this one I've got to bring up as well. Bring this up from eight to sixty-four. Photon scale. Adaptive first bounce. Somewhere in here there was a number of bounces. I don't actually see. Okay, so let's let's save this. I'll crack open my project again. And we'll see. A, the first thing that should happen is we should end up uh, a ton of uh, we should get a ton of increase in the amount of time it takes for my uh, my world to generate. There's the okay. There's my project maps here. So when I do a light mass uh, a light pass now in here. Uh, what we should see is actually a ton more time. So I'm going to make sure my quality is set to production, which it is, and I'm going to build the lighting only. And instead of this taking 20, 30 seconds, with the scale up that I did, this should actually take quite a bit more time. Now, when all is said and done, uh, when I've gone and done this for everything, we should end up with something that takes um, several hours to go in and, and push through. So that's okay. I haven't got a lot of lights that really are uh, affecting too much in here. Uh, what did you say, Briz? Uh, yeah, it's 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 similar to what people do in Archviz. Um, of the scene so far, way too many knickknacks. Like you said, it's going to take me forever. Yeah, I'm well, I'm feeling you with that too, Bray, right? I'm in the in the same boat. What is Oh there it is. I'm just opening up your screenshot here now. That's yeah, not too bad. It's getting there, Bray. I think you just got to uh, keep plugging away with uh, with the lighting, right?
I think you've just got to uh, keep toning it up and toning it down, you know, checking how dark your darks are and how light your lights are. Uh, another really good thing you can do, too, I haven't done this yet myself here either, is to get yourself a, um, a uh, light mass importance volume and bring that into your world. So what this object is, this is it here. It's just this yellow volume. When you do your light baking, anything that finds itself inside of this volume will get a much higher quality time spent on it doing the baking. And so typically what I'll do with this thing here is try to try to put it in the center of the world, you know, which I can do here. And then scale it out to the point that it's only as big as you absolutely need it to be. So probably about there, one click bigger. And then uh, same thing here with the, uh, the top. Go and scale it up and make sure that your entire level is contained within this volume. And uh, and this is going to help the uh, the light bake again. So if I build my lighting again, again, we're going to get a step up in the amount of time. And it's going to give us, again, a step up in quality. And so all of those numbers that are in the uh, in the production setup, uh, the more you, you kind of get those set up correctly, um, the better your, your end results are going to be and the, the more accurate re your results are going to be. Um, now, I've set all of my lights, uh, everything that I've got here point light wise, everything is set to be movable. In fact, I think the skylight is, uh, is the skylight movable, the skylight's movable too. So everything is set to be movable. And, uh, and that means that they're casting dynamic shadows instead of baked shadows. Um, and that's giving me like really nice, crisp and clean shadows in here. It's more expensive, but it means that I'm going to get this really nice. You can see just the hint of it there. Um, there, that's better. You can see the entire outline of the furnace, like really nice and clean. And so it means that I'm going to get these really nice shadows in places. Um, but again, it's more expensive. Now, the only reason I'm doing this is that I'm in a very uh, contained level. I'm in a very small environment here. So uh, it allows me to do that without uh, without too much, uh, too much issue. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, that exponential height fog, once you've got that set up correctly, man, it really does a good job. Now, the, the height fog and the skylight are both going to use the same cube map. And uh, and that's another really important thing to set up. Uh, it, does, uh, it does a lot to your world. Anyway, uh, I think with that, I'm going to call this a night. Uh, I didn't get too much done here, but I got, to, I got that stupid freaking furnace out of my life. Um, which is good. And so uh I'm gonna have to see what I do with the lighting here. I may I may take all my point lights and uh and increase them a little bit in terms of their intensity. Oh we got eight. Let's bring it up to ten. And uh I might just, you know, increase their brightness a little bit just to uh make it feel a little bit more accurate. I gotta put the actual mesh in there for the bulbs as well. Um, uh, because that'll be very telling too to whether or not this looks accurate. And then yeah, once I can uh, once I can set that up so that they're kind of doing what I want them to do, you know, checking to see how big that radius is, checking to make sure that my fall off is doing what I want it to do, you know, that I'm getting light kind of in every corner of this thing. You know, this is an area here where this thing's light is falling off just shy of that far wall. And uh, I want to try and make sure that there's no place here in between any of these lights that is not being hit. And so that'll be important to uh, making sure that this reads correctly. Um, I had thoughts, too, of putting a refrigerator back here and keeping the door open in the fridge. And so that might, uh, that might change a lot as well. But anyway, it's definitely starting to, uh, to feel a little bit dark and danky in here the way that I want. Um, and again, there's kind of this balance that you're going to do right in, uh, in playing around with the intensity here, uh, 
So this is the intensity uh, of this light. What the hell is that? 0.2. Let's do 0.3. Right, so I can brighten that up. Um, but I can also type the, uh, the exponential height fog. And I can play around with the, the density of the fog here. And so I can, I can pitch the fog back a little bit, but increase the, uh, the ambient lighting in the room, which will change a lot too. Now, once you build in your ambient, uh, your, when you actually have your cube map in here, let me bring in a cube map to show you, uh, what that does. If I go and do a, um, let's do it up here, uh, cube, scene capture cube. I'm just going to go put this in the world. It's make sure I can see it. There it is there. Uh, inside of my textures folder. Materials and textures. We're going to do a render cube. Like so. And uh, we're going to put the cube into here. So that it is capturing the room. You can see it there now. There's my room. So the capture is working correctly. And I probably want to bring this up to eye height. And I can turn that off now. And now, if I go and grab certain assets, like the exponential height fog, I can put this guy in here. Oh, it's not going to let me. Uh, with this skylight. Are you going to work in here? No. So I've got to actually generate a... Uh, I'm going to generate an image from this. Uh, uh, create a static texture. And I can put that in there. And let's do that with the exponential height fog. Put that in there. And then we're going to go reset the intensity of the fog. And I'm going to go to the skylight. And let's reset its intensity. So you can see what this does once you have an environment room in here. Um, you can see that like a lot of my really blacks are gone. If I do this. You can see that like the darkest shadowy area I get. Right? It's not reading as being black. Everything is sort of lit up a little bit now. Um, which is kind of cool in what it's doing. Um, there's a few things that are that are kind of artifacting from this. Uh, you can see that we're getting um, outside here. Oop, there we go. In the environment outside, we can see my, my cube map being rendered. And so that's that's a little bit of an issue. But you can see what this does. Like it it makes it feel a little bit more accurate. And again, if I were to go do another building of the light here, this will all update again, and we'll get something again a little bit closer to being accurate. And again, every time I make one of these changes, every time I do one of these things, my light bake uh, slows down and slows down and slows down to the point that, you know, I'm getting very, very warm colors in here uh, now. Um, but when you, when you see this playable now, like it's a very, very different place than it was a moment ago. And so you can see, I've got to fix what's going on outside. There's a lot of like funky light bleed from the outside, but in terms of like the room itself, you can see that I can actually even darken it now, now that I've got that environment in there. And so... Uh, it does a lot. This should really help the, the pickups, too. Um, because their light is coming from the environment. And so, if I go and... Like, that's what I want to get, is that... You know, now it's blown out. It was too dark before. I want to make it so that each one of these things, when you pick it up, just looks perfect. And so... The idea is to get the lighting in such a way that, you know, that kind of thing happens. And so, yeah, these lights, I turned up the intensity on all my lights, and so I can probably pitch them back a little bit. But, uh, you know, this still kind of has that dank and, and dark basement feeling, but uh, there's just a little bit more life to it now. And so, yeah. And so anyway, that's going to be the goal with this, is to kind of keep ramping this stuff up, ramping this stuff up, ramping this stuff up. Uh, I'm not going to use this texture cube here. Like, again, when you look at this thing, it's just an empty environment, right? And I want it to actually be the cluttered environment. In fact, it would be nicer to grab this 
using the actual lighting that's in here. You can see how blown out the lighting is in here. I'd like it to actually be a little bit closer to what the lighting looks like, like this. And so that'll be the, uh, that'll be the goal. And so I'll go and save all this and close this off. We're going to call this a night for now. Um, lighting is one of those things that I, I don't ever see it as being a, a complete, a completed thing. It's one of those things that as you keep working on the environment and you keep making changes to things, you know, you keep tweaking the lighting and keep tweaking it and keep tweaking it. It's kind of an organic process. Anyway, thanks for hanging out, guys, and uh, and the stimulating conversation. And uh, again, I'm going to be uh, continuing working on this in the next few days here. Again, uh, doing this in the evenings after 8 o'clock. And so uh, I hope to see you in the next couple of days. And uh, hopefully I can get this thing done in the, uh, I don't know, next, next few days anyway. I've got a lot of assets to make, but uh, I want to get the functionality built and complete. So hopefully we get there in the next couple of days. So thanks again for watching. And until next time, we'll see you then.